Well, good afternoon and welcome to today's meeting of Suffolk County Council. Our council is meeting Council's King Edmund Chamber for the first time since February 2020. I'm Councillor Graham Newman, Chairman of the County Council, and I will be chairing today's meeting. Uh, the meeting is being broadcast live and is available to watch on the Council's website and whilst we're in public session, and a recording will also be available for, re for viewing after the meeting. Uh, members of the public and the press may also record, film or broadcast this meeting uh, when the public and the press are not lawfully excluded, and that won't happen today, in line with the Council's published guidance, and provided that due courtesy and respect are shown to others in attendance. Councillors would have received the protocol document for this meeting. Can I remind you, as there is no social distancing possible in this building, those in attendance are encouraged to wear a face mask throughout unless you are addressing the meeting or you are exempt. Can I remind speakers to wait for me to ask them to speak before turning on their microphone? When you are speaking, please ensure you use the microphone to speak directly into it so you can clearly be heard on the audio recording and the webcast, and obviously take a mask off if you are wearing it. Also, please avoid holding your papers or placing IT equipment in front of the microphone as that will affect the sound quality. I'm not anticipating any emergencies this afternoon, but please familiarise yourself with the fire escapes and listen for any instructions in the event of an emergency. Now, the first item on today's agenda is, is Suffolk in Focus. And I'm delighted to welcome uh, Christine Luxton, the Chief Executive of the Suffolk Wildlife Trust, uh, to today's meeting. Christine was appointed Chief Executive of the Trust in August 2020. She's a biologist and a primary school teacher by training but her interest in environmental education brought her to the Trust in 1998 as Education Manager, having previously worked nationally for the UK Wildlife Trusts and the Royal Society for Nature Conservation in Jordan. With a particular interest in behaviour change and connecting people to nature, she became the Trust's Head of Engagement, leading project development and fundraising to widen opportunities for people to make nature part of their daily lives. This culminated in the project to transform Carlton Marshes on the edge of Lowestoft into a nature destination for the Southern Broads National Park. Now, the Trust celebrated its 60th anniversary earlier this year, and that was marked by a visit from Her Royal Highness, uh, the Princess Royal, to the Carlton Marshes Nature Reserve. Councillors, it gives me great pleasure to ask Christine to address you all. Christine. <laughs> Councillor Newman for the invitation to, to speak today. As Suffolk's nature charity, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to share our 60th anniversary celebrations with you all. Um, and I'm really excited to be in a room full of people for the first time. So it's a curious celebration. As you will all be very aware, nature has declined catastrophically in our lifetimes. And there's no doubt that the next decade has to be the one in which we tackle the climate and biodiversity emergencies. And yet now, in the midst of a global health crisis, society's recognition of the need for nature has never been higher. So this is the Suffolk Wildlife Trust that you are probably most familiar with. Over the 60 years, our network of 50 nature reserves, or the, the dots on the map, has safeguarded many of the county's most precious wildlife places. They root us in communities across the county. They're the focus for our 1,400 volunteers and the wild learning officers at our larger nature reserves, the, the ones in black, and indeed in the parks in, in Ipswich, lead wide-ranging activity programs from wild babies, wild tots, volunteering for teenagers, courses for adults, school visits, family days, and indeed this summer, Suffolk County Council funded places at our holiday clubs uh, for children on free school meals. Thank you for that. So one of the Trust's fundamental beliefs is that life with nature is good for us all, and so all of our nature reserves, or 50 of them, are free for anyone to visit. 
And that is made possible by the incredible support that we receive from our members. And uh, just talking to Councillor Newman be before the meeting, um, he was surprised to hear that we had 4% of households in Suffolk are members of the Trust. Um, that's 4% of, of, of letterboxes and translates, like I'm told, into about 28,000 voters, which he thought you might be interested to, to hear. So we are absolutely a grassroots charity with a mandate to stand up for nature in our county, uh, which we do in many ways, including advocating for nature through the planning system. So, as, as you've heard, as part of our 60th celebrations, we were very honoured to welcome Her Royal Highness the Princess Royal to, to open the new visitor centre and, and reserve at Carlton Marshes in Lowestoft. And I wanted to share a few photographs from this summer with you at Carlton Marshes, so you can see, see uh, what it's like and why it matters to the people of Lowestoft. So like all our reserves, the trails were open throughout the pandemic for the communities on their doorstep to, to exercise, to escape into nature, and latterly, as this family were doing, to spend time in nature with their friends and their family. And over the last 18 months, I think we have all realised that nature is not a luxury. I'm immensely proud that we as the Trust have been able to play our part in supporting the physical and mental health and well-being of our county during this time. And of course, we will continue to do so. So at Carlton Marshes, with the land purchase, the habitat creation, the visitor centre, the nature trails, the, the, the mooring, um, it's an £8 million investment in the county, including over £4 million from the National Lottery Heritage Fund and over 4,000 individual donations to make the project happen. So with that in mind, I'm delighted that we will be welcoming your Biodiversity Policy Development Panel to, to, count, to, to Carlton Marshes for a research visit uh, later, this, later this month. So with the reserve stretching over 1,000 acres, Carlton Marshes is bringing back nature to Suffolk's part of the Broads National Park. Notice I didn't call it the Norfolk Broads. And with it, we're creating a nature destination that will attract visitor spend into the local economy and extend nature-based tourism up into Lowestoft. So really, really impactful for those communities in the northeast of our county. And the economic impact goes further. By working on a landscape scale, we are able to embed nature-based solutions to climate change into the design of the habitats. So you can see on the slide here, the river wall that's part of Altered Dyke, that's designed to overtop when there's a surge tide, and in doing that, we should protect Alton Broad from flooding. And of course, all those re-wetted former arable fields are all sequestering carbon. Which takes us into the future, the next 10 years. We're celebrating our 60th anniversary, but with very much an, an eye on the future. And with an urgency driven by the climate and biodiversity crisis, we are very clear we need to bring nature back. It's not only individual species that are threatened, the col collapse in the abundance of nature also means that many of our ecosystems are not functioning as they should. So our vision for 2030 is a wilder Suffolk. A wilder Suffolk where nature is thriving and abundant once again. And most importantly, it's driven by that grassrootsness that I mentioned earlier. It's a wilder Suffolk where nature is thriving and abundant because everyone is doing more to help. So we as a trust will continue to protect what we have, but just as we have done at Carlton Marshes, we need to restore what we've lost. But now at a scale and a pace that needs everyone to, to play their part. So Suffolk Wildlife Trust, and indeed the Wildlife Trust nationally, are championing the target of 30% of our land and sea being in recovery for nature by 2030. So we're playing our part in a global target set by the UN Convention on Bio Biological Diversity, which recognises that 30% is a tipping point in ecology. It's the level at which habitats are sufficiently large and sufficiently connected for ecosystems to recover and to function effectively. This map illustrates land use by area in our county and shows the challenge of 
but also the opportunity. As a farming county, working with farmers and landowners will be key to securing the changes in land management for nature that we need. And we've been doing this for many years. It's been part of the way the Trust has worked for much of the 60, our 60 years. But with the clock ticking now to 2030, we are scaling up. And as a charity, we are investing in more farmland and river advisors to help drive this shift in scale and pace that we need. And by working with the county's most forward-thinking farmers, we want to show how nature-friendly farming can be part of a commercial farming future. And our rivers are those thin, blue nature lines across our landscape. And as we, our approach will be to work on a catchment scale, working with clusters of farmers so that we can restore healthy functioning ecosystems that can then deliver the ecosystem services that we need uh, to deal and give resilience to our county uh, in, in these times of climate change. But we can't do this by ourselves. And we've been talking to, to Richard Rout and his team and really hope that as a county, as a council, just as you have with the greenest county, you will bring leadership to this and embrace the 30% target in the planning and delivery of the nature recovery networks that will be part of the Environment Bill this autumn. Working together and building on the excellent work that Richard's team have done on the Norfolk and Suffolk Nature Compendium and bringing a collective ambition and energy to this to get the low carbon nature rich Suffolk that we, that we need. And on that, I just wanted very briefly to say, yes, we are doing wilding. It is part of our 30-30 mix. Uh, yes, we already do it. We were doing it before it was called wilding and we've got more of it to come. Um, we're just at the beginning of wilding Foxborough Farm near Melton, uh, which will start after the harvest. And we're working with the University of Suffolk on the monitoring there, so it becomes a case study that others can look to. And so with biodiversity net gain being part of the planning system in the future, wouldn't it be amazing to think creatively and perhaps pull some of the funding that will unlock ambitious landscape scale wilding projects for Suffolk? So I said earlier that our vision for the world of Suffolk is where nature is thriving and abundant because everyone is doing more to help. And people are the other side of our wilder equation. So just as 30% is the ecological tipping point, social science has given us a tipping point of one in four at the point where the minority begin to influence the behavior of the majority. So only 25% of people in Suffolk are needed to be on board taking action for nature's recovery for us to achieve the wilder Suffolk that we are aiming for. For this to be the social norm, so thinking about the No May, May campaign, which, which lots of councils have been involved with, boosting insect abundance by letting grasses grow and flower, it only needs a shift of one in four people seeing long grass on our verges as a norm for it to become normalised. And look how easily we've got used to wearing masks. So rechange is possible. So over the next decade, we want to mobilise our supporters, their friends, family, schools, businesses, community groups, churches, partner organisations, all of you, uh, into a movement for nature, uh, for nature's recovery, and that's what we're calling Team Wilder. So we'll have wilder gardens, wilder streets, wilder towns, and with it, we hope Team Wilder can become the engagement piece around the nature recovery network, so the nature recovery network will be owned, valued and championed by the people of Suffolk. So, thinking of our 60th, we're looking to the future, we're, but we're drawing on our 60 years of community-led, community-owned action for nature, but now with the scale and the urgency that our time needs. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed, Christine, for the very thought-provoking address, and, and I think particularly relevant as, as we look to become carbon neutral over the next uh, nine years, and it seems like that nine years will soon be eight, and it'll soon be seven, so we've really got to pull our fingers out on this. Um, just let you know, folks, that uh, Christine has left a couple of copies of 
of the Suffolk Wildlife Trust magazine in the uh, democratic area. So if you want to have a look at that or even become a member, I'm sure you'll be welcomed. I have to say that as a non-member at the moment. Uh, maybe I'll have my arm twisted before I leave the building. Anyway, you're very welcome to stay with us and take a seat in the gallery if you wish, or of course leave the meeting also. But thank you very much indeed for, for your most interesting talk. I love the railway synonym as well, but the underground does <laughs> Uh, the chap who invented that London Underground map's got a lot to answer for, hasn't he? Yes. Okay, moving on to agenda item two, ladies and gentlemen, Chairman's announcements. And it is, you know, particularly for me, I think, a great sadness that I announced the death of our former county councillor, Len Jacklin, who passed away on the 29th of June, 2021. Uh, Len was the Labour County Councillor for Alton Division in Lowestoft uh, from May 2013 to May 2017. He served on a number of committees during his time on the council, including the Audit Committee, Pension Fund Committee, and Suffolk Police and Crime Panel and Scrutiny Committee. After his time as a councillor, Len went on to serve as an independent member of the police and crime panel between uh, January 2018 and March 2021, over a period when I was also with him, and he was a, a very fervent contributor to that panel as well. Then it's with great sadness I must announce the passing of Ralph Nesley, who worked in waste services as an operation officer for over 35 years, specialising in closed landfills and hazardous waste. Ralph was a very popular man, and although quiet, he had a quirky sense of humour. He was an absolute expert in his field, uh, becoming known as the Yoda of the waste team. Alongside his diligence and conscientious attitude to do every job to the best of his ability, he would keep the team entertained, his personal witticisms being affectionately referred to as Ralphisms. Ralph was a classic public servant who loved his job serving the community of Suffolk, and he'll be sorely missed by all who work with him. And then additionally, with great sadness, I have to tell you, announced the death of crew manager Steve Simmons, passed away on the 24th of August following a short illness. Steve was a member of the Suffolk Fire and Rescue for 33 years and was an on-call firefighter and crew manager at the Sudbury Fire Station, as well as a crew manager in the Berry Protection Office. Our thoughts are with the family, friends and colleagues at this time. Uh, please can I ask you now to stand for a minute's silence as a mark of respect uh, for Len, Ralph and Steve. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor, ladies and gentlemen. And moving on, um, I need to tell you of John Last's retirement. I'd like to congratulate John Last on his retirement. John has recently retired from the Suffolk Fire and Rescue Service after an incredible 48 years as an on-call firefighter in Leyston. His loyal service has been recognised at the highest level in December 2019, he was awarded a British Empire Medal in the New Year's Honours List. John is a highly respected member of the local community in Leyston and within the service. I'm sure councillors would like, me to, like to join me in thanking John for all his commitment and dedication over the past 48 years. Ken Williamson is also retiring. 
from his role as area manager with Suffolk Fire and Rescue after a fantastic career spanning 29 years. Ken has served Suffolk in numerous roles and locations and was a key member of the senior team during the 2019 inspection from Her Majesty's Inspectorate for Constabularies and Fire and Rescue Services, in which the service received a good in each of the three pillars. I'm sure councillors will, uh, will join me in wishing both John and Ken very happy and well-deserved retirements. Anita Farrant, former Assistant Director for Nursing and Early Help, retired on the 30th of June. Anita was a nurse, a midwife and a health visitor and started working for Suffolk County Council in 2011 uh, when the Health Visiting and School Nursing Service for East and West Suffolk moved to Suffolk County Council. She led on the successful bid to provide a 0-19 year old um, healthy child service across the whole county and on designing the new service and also on creating a family hubs model. Anita is a passionate advocate for children and nursing. She is much missed by her many colleagues, both in the County Council and in partner organisations. I'm sure Council will want to record its thanks to Anita and wish her all the best for a long and happy and healthy retirement. <laughs> Very pleased to announce that Suffolk Archives Sharing Suffolk Stories, Pride in Suffolk's Past project has received a National Archives and Records Association UK and Ireland a Archive Volunteer Award. It was commended for the way it engaged with people who do not traditionally use or interact with archives. Dedicated volunteers connected with uh, Suffolk's LGBTQ plus community to explore and showcase hidden or untold stories from the past in innovative ways through escape rooms, art, dance and film workshops, drama performances and family craft activities. They also collected contemporary lived experiences from today's community. These were combined and shared in a groundbreaking exhibition at The Hold. Congratulations to everyone involved. The Vertas Group has been awarded highly commended in the Rosper Facilities Management Sector Award. Achieving this award is a high achievement and highlights the continued commitment to developing health, safety and well-being across the group. This is a significant improvement on last year's award and is the third consecutive year where the Vertas Group has received recognition for excellent health and safety performance with improved successes year on year. So congratulations to the Vertas team on that. I think they do deserve a round of applause. Bearing in mind the later pleasure we've got. You have seen appended to your papers, uh, ladies and gentlemen, my engagements. And of course, it's very interesting that over these past couple of months, um, sort of the, the civic um, activities have taken on a much higher profile um, as we've recovered from the pandemic. Um, in particular, of course, there was on 21st of June, uh, Suffolk Day Proclamation and presentation of the Suffolk Medal Ceremony at Clare. Um, 19th of July, the new commander to the 100th Air Refuelling Wing Ceremony at RAF Milden Hall, which is a key part of the economic activities in the, in the west of the county. Um, 27th of July, I attended the presentation of the Queen's Award for Voluntary Service uh, to the Great Cornard based Success After Stroke. Uh, that was held at the Royal Harry Jock Club. And I have to say, you know, if you do know anybody who's suffered stroke and is, is working hard to recover, particularly if you near, live near um, uh, Sudbury Cornard, that kind of area, uh, that group are well worth getting in contact with because they do tremendous work and that's why they've had this uh, award. Finally, I'd like to thank all those who responded to my call for nominations for Suffolk-wide charities that I could adopt as my charity in 2021-22. The clear winner of that was actually Suffolk Mind, uh, which given all that's come to pass over these last 18 months is hardly surprising. However, uh, my predecessor, Councillor Finch, has just completed his successful 18-month tenure of the chairmanship in which he supported Suffolk Mind. Uh, so I've decided on the second most popular choice and equally relevant, I think, 
um, East Anglian Air Ambulance. I've already had preliminary conversations with their fundraising officer, and uh, whilst I don't expect we will be able to hold uh, social events like concerts and quiz nights, which we've traditionally had to, to um, supplement the funds of the chairman's charity, um, I will announce some kind of personal challenge in, later in the year for which I will be after your sponsorship. And if you can just bear in mind what I've just said, um, something's coming up shortly which will actually commit you to doing that. So that concludes my formal announcements. And now, we, before we move on to the business for today's meeting, given that it's been 18 months since we've been in this chamber and the number of us are new to the council, I would like us to undertake a test vote. So we will now take the test vote using the microphone and voting system in front of you. The motion that I want you to vote on is, this council will support the chairman's fundraising activities <laughs> during the coming year. Now don't press anything on your touch screen yet, uh, but once the vote has been opened, I will ask each of you to vote either yes, no, or abstain. And actually, we're not looking for too many no's, but uh, um, you know, I, I'm sure you will take this in good part. Are you all ready? I will start the vote. Please vote now using the yes, no, or abstain buttons on your touch screen. Yes. <laughs> Please ensure that your screen shows the words, your vote has been cast. Has everybody voted? Rachel, we have one here. Shows otherwise I'm not working. Yeah, no, nope, don't. Okay. <laughs> right, well, I should now close the vote. And there is... Oh, oh, look at that. <laughs> right, well, um, we'll have a recorded vote on this then. But, uh, <laughs> and as you can see, the result of the vote is 44 um, in favour of doing this. Uh, two aren't, and 12 have abstained. So thank you very much for that participation. Do we need to add Councillor Everett to this uh, vote? We do. So that might make it uh, 45 for. <laughs> Lovely. And that does actually mean that the vote is carried, ladies and gentlemen. OK, moving on. Um, it's now time for apologies for absence. And I've received the following apologies from absence from councillors. Uh, Councillor Alexander Nicholl, uh, Joe Mason, Sandy Martin, Penny Otten, Bill Quinton, Peggy McGregor, Craig Rivett, Jenny Ceresa, Debbie, Ren uh, Debbie Reynolds, Debbie Richards. <laughs> You're my age away there, aren't I? My goodness me. Uh, Colin Noble, Jamie Starling, Melanie Vigo de Galadoro, Stephen Burroughs, and David Nettleton. Are there any more apologies for absence, please? Okay, thank you very much. We will move on to. Oh, we have, sorry, Stuart? Yeah. Um, Councillor Lawson. Thanks for that. Okay, item four is declarations of interest and dispensations. Do councillors have any interest to declare in respect of today's agenda? Just raise your hand. I see no hands raised. Thank you very much. Moving on to agenda item five, our minutes of the previous meeting held on 27th of May 2021 at uh, Worsted Park, you will remember. Any uh, councillor wishes to comment on these minutes, please indicate to the monitoring officer that you wish to speak. If there are no comments, I will take it that council is content to approve the minutes as a correct record. I see no hands raised, so we move on to agenda item six, and I will sign those uh, minutes as a correct record. Agenda item six is public questions, and two public questions have been received. 
I will ask questioners to take a seat in the chamber to ask their question. I will then ask the appropriate cabinet member to respond. The question and answer will be recorded as part of the minutes of the meeting. The question one is from Mr. Kenneth Maxton, who is not in attendance today. I will therefore read out the question that Mr. Maxton has submitted. In April 2019, Felixstowe Academy delayed referring to the council's LADO, a person likely to cause harm to children, for 25 days rather than within 24 hours. What criticism or advice to future practice did the Academy receive from the Council for this safeguarding failure? Councillor Reader, would you care to respond to that, please? Thank you, Chairman, and as customary, thank you very much indeed for the question. The local authority takes safeguarding concerns very seriously, and as such, the LADO service addressed the delay with the Academy at the time and advice was given. In terms of future practice, the LADO service contributes to the material that is used for training within schools and also liaises with the re resolution team in education and learning on feedback to schools to continually improve and develop delivery of service. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Reader. Moving on to question two now, and this is for Mrs. Fiona McCauley. Would you like to take a seat at the microphone, uh, Mrs. McCauley, and when you're ready, ask your question? Thank you, and hello again, everyone. In rural villages in Suffolk, where next to no public bus services exist, can the council representative explain the purpose and benefit of cutting the size of a school bus on certain routes where there are plenty of parents willing to pay for spare seats on the original sized bus, the cost of which would easily be covered and perhaps even a profit made? Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. McCauley. Councillor Hood, will you respond, please? Uh, yes, and thank you, Mrs. McCauley, for asking uh, such a pertinent question. Uh, every summer, school travel routes are reviewed to ensure there are enough seats for pupils who are eligible for Suffolk County Council funded school travel and post-16 students who qualify for travel. It is a parent's responsibility to make arrangements for their child to travel to and from school when they are not eligible for Suffolk County Council funded school travel. And unfortunately, the council is not legally allowed to procure transport for the purpose of providing travel for non-eligible pupils. For families who live in rural areas and for those pupils who may not be attending their nearest suitable school, the council has worked and does work with bus operators to review the public transport network, and this has enabled more children to travel to school on public transport. We have also procured more vehicles that are compliant with Public Service Vehicle Accessibility Regulations 2020, so that non-eligible pupils may be able to purchase a spare seat. To give an example, there are now a number of registered bus services to Thurston Community College, the TN 988 that starts in Stowe Market, operated by Mullis, has been in place for a few years, and from September 2021, Mullis will operate additional registered services, routes TN 162 and TN 164, both serving El Emswell, Elmswell, one route north, one route south of the village, operating at school times. The TN 164 has now been amended by the operator to encompass Walsham, the Willows, and Badwell Ash. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Hood. Mrs. McCauley, would you like to ask a supplementary question? Yes, I would indeed. Um, you haven't really answered um, my question about what the benefit, but glossing over that, I'll move on to my follow on question. I am acutely aware that the council opinion is that it's parents' responsibility. However, this is becoming more and more difficult when the council constantly changes the goalposts. 
I planned my child's route to school based on a pass that was provided last year when we were forced to move house. Um, and this has now been taken away from him this year. Um, that particular bus, the TN106 from Walsh and Lee Willows, um, has been reduced in size. And um, over the last five days, or last three days, there has been at least four or five spare seats on that bus. Um, I now pay for my son to travel on the TN164 that you've mentioned in your response um, at an additional cost to myself. Um, the spare seat cost is £930 a year. I pay £1,125 a year because I can't purchase it through yourselves. However, in your response, you have intimated that the rerouting of the TM164 was down to the count, county council liaising with the bus service. But in, actually, in actual fact, this was rerouted as a response because of the... Um, outrage from parents. Can I ask you to come to a question, please? I am Mr. coming to the, to the question, but quite, as my question now, wasn't actually answered, I feel some latitude could be given. Um, my actual question is, do you not think that this is a falsehood and that you are misleading the council and parents in intimating that you, the council arranged that with the bus service when it was actually down to the bus service and parents contacting them, asking them for help? Because originally the TM164, I was told my son had to walk to Great Ashfield, which is 3.7 miles away, to catch that bus. Councillor Hood. Yes, thank you. Um, that was uh, quite a, a number, there were not quite a number of things that you were saying in your supplementary question, and I'm very happy to give you a written answer in addition. However, I certainly wouldn't agree that uh, anything I've said is misleading, nor would this council mislead anyone intentionally. Um, we do, as a council, work very hard to try and facilitate appropriate transport where we can and um, my understanding is that um, as I said the TN164 has now been amended by the operator to encompass Walsham the Willows so in any event um, I appreciate your concerns probably the best thing is for a, a proper written response to come to you to attempt to assist in your child getting to school Thank you very much, Mr. McCauley, and to Councillor Hood. Moving on to agenda item seven, then, motion number one. In line with the arrangements agreed by the Council, the total time available for motions today will be 60 minutes. And I imagine that, um, given the kind of circumstances we're in, uh, we want to try and keep the debate as tight as, and objective as possible and not wander on too much. So any single motion should only be allowed to be debated for 30 minutes under one or more amendments, unless one or more amendments are moved, in which case a further 15 minutes will be allowed. I will ensure the proposer, seconder and main opposition spokespersons have had the opportunity to speak within the time allowed in accordance with the rules of the debate. So I now call upon Councillor Matthew Hicks to propose motion one. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman, and can I just start off by saying how good it is to see so many people back in the King Edmund Chamber for a full council meeting. Yeah. And I'm really delighted that there are 55 members of my group, uh, and I also welcome other members from the other parties to the Chamber today. And I really look forward to fruitful debates over the coming years. Uh, Mr Chairman, the motion before us is clear in recognising the importance of work that is needed and that lies ahead during a significant period of recovery. I'm proud to say it is our Conservative government that has taken the challenging, tough economic decisions to support our businesses with world-beating furlough schemes, with direct business grants distributed in record time, with self-employment income support schemes, or indeed the bounce-back loan scheme, just to name a few. In Suffolk, we have many great businesses and industries, and we have the BT Global Research and Development Cluster, for example, in Adastral Park, our growing offshore, inshore uh, energy coast, 
our food and drink sector, our agri-sector, our tourism, hospitality, home of horse racing, I could go on, but these are just to name a few. And they all have a huge role to play as we recover from the economic impact of the pandemic. Now, to enable growth in these sectors, and indeed in new sectors, such as the very welcome recent announcement of the Freeport East at Felixstowe, which is projected to generate 13,500 new jobs over 30 years, requires us to play our part. We recognize that raising levels of skills and qualifications involves raising aspirations and motivation. We must focus on raising levels of qualification and the skills team is working hard to ensure there is a sufficient supply of the right type of skill set and capabilities are available. And this is done by focusing on what will be required to facilitate this growth moving forward. It is by working alongside our providers, our colleges, employers and other key stakeholders that we can then understand what competencies and capabilities will be required and to ensure there is availability and indeed uptake of the relevant training. We must leverage investment to achieve the creation of more jobs and in our role in planning and procurement, we are working to secure as many beneficial employment opportunities for our residents from investment and development in the county. And this, of course, includes infrastructure developments across Suffolk, and of course we have the Gull Wing in Lowestoft, and the skills team are supporting our employers to create apprenticeship opportunities for all age groups and our Apprenticeship Suffolk service is working alongside all these organisations so that we can actually capitalise with government. Investment is coming forward with the Kickstart programme, bringing opportunities for young people in Suffolk. We recognise the importance, of course, of inward investment into the region. And I'm really pleased, uh, in partnership with the new Anglia-Lep, which I'm a board member of, that we have established the Norfolk and Suffolk Unlimited. And if you're not familiar with it, I really urge you to go on the website and have a look. This is a really successful inward investment service that brings together private and public sector partners to promote growth, to boost business growth, and drive inward investment into our county. Suffolk Public Sector Leaders has allocated one and a half million over the next two years through the Climate Emergency Plan as part of our ambition to reach net zero by 2030. And the key goals of this plan are to leverage additional finance to deliver measures. Mr Chairman, I'm really delighted to bring this motion and I ask for the Chamber's support today because Suffolk has a great talent pool. We have a huge variety of outstanding businesses and we have excellent connections to the UK and indeed beyond. And by supporting our businesses, we can deliver so much more for our residents, which in turn supports UK PLC, as we emerge from the most difficult time with optimism for the future. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Hicks. Do you have a seconder, please? Councillor Smith, I invite um, you to formally second the motion. Thank you. Yes, Chairman, I would like to formally second the motion. And if I may, I will speak later in the debate. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Andrew Stringer is the spokesperson for the opposition. Uh, may speak for up to five minutes at any time during this debate. And so, do you wish to speak now? Yeah, I'll, I'll speak. Okay, fine. Well, I'll now open the debate, so if you wish to speak, please signal that you wish to do so and wait for confirmation that your signal has been received uh, by the monitoring officer. Each speaker in the debate has up to three minutes. I think Councillor Kemp, you were first on the list, please. Right, thank you, Chairman. Well, I think everybody in this chamber will support the drive to create uh, more jobs and opportunities within the county of Suffolk. I specifically want to address two issues that I can't see are covered 
within the uh, proposals. And one is obviously the biggest earner that we have within our midst, which is tourism, which is bolstered, of course, by the service industries that have suffered so badly under this current situation. I would like to see some firm proposals to further bolster the tourist aspect of our future plans from this county. It is the biggest earner and I believe the biggest employer of labour within this county. So that's number one. Number two, I hope to be very parochial, but I was born in Long Melford, so I'm going to use that as an example. In Long Melford, in 1960, the population was 2,250. The current population, not adding all the many developments we've had recently, is in the region of 4,000 people. Going back to the earlier year I mentioned, the employment opportunities within our own parish, I underline within our own parish, was in the region of 500. So people could get on their bicycle or even walk to work. Many of those were in the manufacturing industries which have been lost to this country. And what have we got today? We have, counting service industries, barely 100 jobs. So I would like to see a strong emphasis from this council to engender further opportunities within our villages and small towns for employment, to seek entrepreneurs and to bolster their activity by way of grants. I accept what the leader has said about LEPs. I've been involved with a recent grant application for one of those small businesses so there we are. I ask for two concentrations, one on the tourist aspect and the other on encouraging things back to what they were. People won't have to travel to London, Stansted, Cambridge, all the things that are in contradiction to our policies on climate control. So we need to engage and propose and bolster the future for small industry within our communities. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kemp. Now, um, so far I've got Councillors Lindsay, Page, Reader, Hood, Hoffensberger and Rout to speak. Did I see Councillor Scarf? Yes, I thought I saw you. Any more there who wish to speak? Oh, I've got you down there, all right. And, and Councillor Stringer, yes, you're on, you're on the list as well. Love the job, so we're moving on then to uh, Councillor Lindsay, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'm really glad that you brought this motion forwards because uh, it's something that really needs to be debated. Um, and I'm afraid it's really disappointing. After all we've been through um, with COVID, after the extinctions we know we're all facing, uh, the flooding, everything, to see you using the tired old language of perpetual economic growth. Um, it just doesn't seem to have sunk in. Um, the reason there is a biodiversity and a climate crisis that we heard about just a few minutes ago is precisely because we spent the post-war decades pursuing infinite economic growth when we have a finite planet. Um, as as uh, Greta Thunberg said, we are at the beginning of a mass extinction and all you can talk about is fairy tales of economic growth, of eternal economic growth. By having economic growth alongside your goal of zero carbon, the council ends up seeing carbon reduction as somehow a boundary or a hindrance to improving human well-being which is surely what we should all be going for. Um, in actual fact, we forget about worshipping growth as a goal and focus on tackling the climate and biodiversity crises. We create a huge opportunity to build back better from the bottom up, strengthening a village and town economies, localising the economies and improving the well-being of our citizens. 
For, an exa for example, there's an army of tradesmen um, now and potential ones in this county that are ready to step up if they're trained to retrofit homes with air source heat pumps and with insulation and all the other technologies that are needed. There are hundreds of potential craftspeople in every village and town who could work from home to be encouraged to upcycle people's old fridges, uh, uh, washing machines and what have you, uh, into useful products rather than allow them to be carted off to the dump or flight it. Um, there are an array of potential entrepreneurs in every town and village in Suffolk, known as the pedestrian pound, who would be unleashed by making our towns and villages walkable, by reducing the traffic in them. Um, so I'm not going to support this motion, um, and uh, I'd urge others not to. We did try to amend it, um, but you weren't interested in that. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, Councillor Lindsay. We're now moving on to Councillor Page, please. Thank you, Chair. Now, my point expands on Councillor Kemp's, in fact. Um, the administration sees the importance of economic growth, but I suggest it looks at growth in context. We all agree that we need a sustainable Suffolk, a Suffolk that is wealthy, healthy, and fit for the future. But surely we've got to look at how we get there. In the Suffolk coast, which was once known as the Heritage Coast, and now, as Councillor Hicks calls it, the Energy Coast, tourism currently nets upwards of £700 million a year. It, it employs over 15,000 people, that's 11,000 full-time equivalents. And the length of it's enjoyed, we, we just heard from Christine Luxton, very passionately, it's enjoyed from Felixstowe to Carlton Marshes. Okay. Yet growth for Suffolk Coastal would seem to involve building infrastructure for Sizewell Sea, which will do nothing towards reducing our carbon footprint before 2030, and would have a devastating impact on the status quo. This would not be growth, it would be negative growth. More and better carbon reduction and sustainable growth would be made by improving sustainable transport in the rural east for residents and tourists and wildlife alike. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Page. Next on the list is Councillor Reader, please. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Uh, I'm very pleased to support this timely motion as we recover from the last 18 months. The opportunities in my division, which covers from the north side of Lake Clothing, including Lowestoft Town Centre, through to Norfolk border. Within the Lowestoft area, there are a huge number of opportunities for economic growth with this council building the Gullwyn Bridge. It brings huge opportunities not only for Lowestoft, but also for Suffolk. I see the Gullwyn Bridge being the catalyst for many of these opportunities of inward investment to our town being taken forward. Suffolk <coughs> County Council has been at the forefront of Lowestoft becoming the centre for operational and maintenance for the offshore wind turbines. The Orbis Energy Centre is a Suffolk asset run by us and has been and continues to be instrumental in Lowestoft leading the way for new offshore businesses. Lowestoft has benefited from the £25 million investment by Scottish Power Renewables with their state-of-the-art Hamilton Road Operations Centre, which provides support to many turbines and has the capacity to support many more. ABP, which operates the port as an extremely exciting one in a generation, if not in two generations, plan for massive investment with their LEAF project, that's the Lowestoft Eastern Energy Facility, which will transform our outer harbour. This project would raise the number of local high paid jobs, which is crucial for any community to be able to support our high street businesses and leisure facilities. Here again, Lowestoft has a great opportunity with the government's town fund investment of £25 million. We must have all these projects coming together or at least following very closely behind 
so that each one can benefit from the excitement and the buzz that each one brings to the area. Mr Chairman, time limits me, but there are many other examples why we should remain optimistic and this motion will give businesses in our county and those looking to move here a very strong message that this authority will encourage and support business growth, which we all know is so vital for the prosperity of our residents. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Councillor Reader. Moving on now to Councillor Hood, please. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I welcome Suffolk County Council's reaffirmation of its support for Suffolk's businesses, including by working to increase levels of skills and qualifications. This motion mentions the horse racing industry, which is based in my ward, uh, and, uh, and it mentions it as an existing hub of excellence. Indeed, the horse racing and breeding industry, located for over 350 years in Newmarket, is one of the United Kingdom's and certainly Suffolk's truly world-beating, world-class industry success stories. We've heard about tourism, it includes tourism as well, but the horse racing and breeding industry is the joint second largest economic contributor and employer in the entire East Anglian Cambridgeshire subregion. Nationally, it employs in the region of 100,000 people, many of them young people. It contributes in the region of £4 billion annually to UK PLC. But its main centre is in Suffolk, Newmarket, the international historic home of horse racing and breeding, a place with two immense internationally world-beating veterinary practices, employing veterinarians, uh, employing uh, nurses, and hundreds, literally hundreds of well-qualified uh, people and ancillary staff. There are over 75 training establishments. There are numerous studs employing hundreds of people. Uh, and these people include many people without any academic qualifications whatsoever, but with a talent for animal husbands, husbandry. There's a racing school, a world-class museum, countless businesses, uh, supplying this national success story. Thousands of people attending the hospitality uh, on offer, employing countless people with a wide variety of skills and expertise. And Suffolk people travel the globe with Suffolk-based horses, frequently returning to Newmarket with glittering prizes, enhancing Suffolk's worldwide reputation and bringing inward investment. And throughout the pandemic, most of these people, as I said, many of them young people, worked to support this important industry. And there was precious little furlough in Newmarket as the horse racing and breeding industry worked throughout the lockdown. This is one of our world-class industries and it supports fulfilling lives and careers for our Suffolk residents, some of whom might not necessarily flourish in more conventional, traditional roles. And I'm very pleased to support this motion, Mr Chairman. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Hood. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are getting a lot of pings, bangs and bongs coming out of computers and other devices. If you could just please um, silence those, or at least turn the volume down, because they will sound incredibly loud over the, um, over the transmission on the web because they're right in front of your microphone. So thank you very much for that. And we now come to Councillor Hoffensberger. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Colleagues, I'd like to take this opportunity to not only support this motion, but also highlight the growing importance and the economic contribution of the social care sector in Suffolk. Too often, social care is thought of as a statutory duty, which costs money to run rather than a dynamic and growing industry in its own right, supporting in excess of 20,000 jobs and worth an estimated half a billion pounds a year to our local economy. Mr Chairman, I want to outline some of the ways Suffolk County Council is already actively helping the sector develop further, thus enabling a continued and increased economic contribution to Suffolk. These initiatives include 
our care market sustainable strategy, which is looking to identify funding and cash flow solutions for providers, promoting the recruitment and retention of care workers, upping the number of care places available, and addressing gaps in specialist support. We are, along with North Norfolk County Council and the DYP, investing £8 million in developing skills of the care workforce. And the launch of our Integrated Care Academy, the first of its type in the country, where we are working in partnership with others to, de to deliver five innovative programmes of support in areas such as education, training and skills. And this will help meet our shared vision to enable the best possible integrated care accessible to all. And we went even fur further in supporting the care sector during the COVID pandemic. Throughout the pandemic, we have provided additional support to our care providers to help them stay in business and to avoid potential business failure, including direct financial support, such as minimum income guarantee and top-ups of the prices we pay for our care. The direct provider support, including infection control fund and rapid testing and workforce capacity grants, has so far totaled £62.5 million. However, this council and the care sector do not stand still. There are continued innovative ways to provide care. The future of social care will also undoubtedly include a growing role for technology, which is already complementing traditional methods of care and support to help people retain their independence for longer. We therefore expect to see the new technology development becoming a larger part of the overall economic contribution of the care sector in Suffolk. I am pleased to say that Suffolk County Council is already ahead of this trend and looking to be a lead authority in the area of digital care, with the recent launch of our new digital care support service, Cassius. Mr Chairman, I support the motion and urge colleagues to do the same. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Hoffenberger. So we've got Councillor Rout, Scarf and Thompson uh, to speak yet, and also Councillor Richard Smith, obviously, to second, and Councillor Stringer to sum up um, for the opposition. So unless there is anybody else wanting to speak, I'm going to close the list now, uh, because we have been well over 30 minutes by the time uh, you've taken those contributions. So Councillor Rout, please. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I'm pleased to speak on this incredibly important motion as we begin to step out of this pandemic. As you would expect, I want to focus on our environmental ambitions for Suffolk and for Suffolk's businesses, and indeed on Suffolk's climate emergency plan. Suffolk public sector leaders have allocated 1.5 million over the next two years to support the initial delivery of the climate emergency plan and our ambitions to achieve net zero emissions by 2030. So many of the themes in the motion resonate with the emergency plan, which emphasises not only the need for collaborative action with businesses, but also the need to address industrial and commercial energy use. This is an area where this council continues to support businesses with access to grants and advice, such as through services like Business Energy Efficiency Anglia, which has helped businesses cut over 1,500 tonnes of carbon each year, and the Carbon Charter, where over 500 businesses are accredited. The East of England, Mr Chairman, is home to over 52% of the UK's installed capacity for offshore wind. Wind farms are continuing to be constructed along our coastline, where shallow waters and fresh winds make it the ideal area for renewable energy. It was said in the House of Commons that the North Sea is to wind as the Middle East is to oil. Some of the world's biggest wind farms are planned for, being planned for or being built a few miles off the Suffolk coastline. And while this brings with it planning challenges, an area where we are at the forefront of the calls for offshore coordination to minimise impact on our communities. It also brings with it huge economic opportunities. Mr Chairman, in August this year, the government launched the UK's first hydrogen strategy. Activities planned in Suffolk will put us at the forefront of this, including Sizewell Seaco launching a demonstrator project to, to produce pink hyd hydrogen powered by electricity from Sizewell B. The hydrogen powered could power vehicles and machinery to lower emissions during the construction of Sizewell C, if it's consented. Hydrogen from this demonstrator could also be used for public transport, such as local buses. Freeport East will also be working with the demonstrator to create a hydrogen hub to decarbonise port operations and help develop alternative fuel port equipment, establishing a test bed to showcase hydrogen's potential in the port environment. 
In addition, we are working with East Suffolk Council on a unique opportunity to create an innovative energy hub de demonstrator project. Mr Chairman, I'm delighted to support this motion today and hope that members recognise, contrary to what Councillor Lindsay may say, that Suffolk is not just at the forefront of the response to the climate emergency, but also that many of our excellent businesses are at the forefront of embracing new green yeah, technologies. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Rout. I now invite Councillor Keith Scarf for a maiden speech, I think, sir. Indeed, Mr Chairman. No, thank you very much. Um, in the original motion, it talks about the existing hubs of excellence and mentions some specific sectors, albeit acknowledging the many others. Uh, our group adds to this list with food production, brewing and distilling, and the voluntary sector. And I'm pleased to say that the leader has at least added one of those to the list in his precursor. And also very pleased to congratulate Councillor Root on his examples uh, for the green economy. I would like to support in particular the inclusion of brewing and distilling. My division has the world-renowned company of Muntons PLC, an acknowledged leader in Maltings technology. Muntons, some of you may know, seek to minimise, reuse and recycle around 99% of its waste products generated. If we are to have any chance of meeting our climate change obligations, then companies such as Muntons are exemplars of how we can achieve economic growth and, more importantly, in a sustainable way. You mentioned green growth in the motion, and I would hope that we as a council embrace sustainable green growth over growth at any cost. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, moving on to Councillor Peter Thompson, also a maiden speaker, I believe. Uh, thank you, Chair, for allowing me to break my door. I'd hardly call it a speech. This will be more a set of rambling thoughts. So um, uh, I didn't plan on speaking on this uh, at the start, however, there were a, a couple of comments made specifically by uh, councillors Kemp and Lindsay that I felt had some dichotomies within them, so I thought I'd uh, give my little bit of input in there. So um, you could probably tell from my accent, I grew up in Liverpool in the 1980s, and I would hardly call that a, a centre of, of uh, economic success. One of the reasons was population collapse. And one of the other reasons was um, the modernisation of Felixstowe docks and the failure to modernise from Liverpool docks. And I saw that with my own eyes with, with things that were around me. When I was a, a child, I think the, the wider Liverpool area had 1.1 to 1.3 million people there, something in the region of 750,000 now. Economic growth is not a bad thing. There are things, uh, there, are, there, there are various flavours of economic growth. And I think the way that we're doing it on these conservative benches and, and uh, with the, uh, the council at the moment is it's very sensible and as councillor Rout says it's hand in hand and sensibly with the uh, climate emergency declaration that we have i would point out that we're in a global economy and um, one of the the people i admire in in the world is elon musk for example and he's gone from sleeping on a couch to having arguably uh, one or, or two of the, the most uh, valuable companies in the world. And he's done that through green technology. I'm going to point out one or two things here that, that we, we do in Suffolk. My ward is uh, Eastgate and Morton Hall, and we've just gone through uh, inst the installation of City Fibre. We're at the cutting edge of modern technology, which will allow us to um, get to villages like Long Melford. Now, I doubt that the villages in Long Melford can build an iPhone as cheaply as they can in China. But what we can do is we can utilise modern technologies, the green economy, and uh, act in a sensible way when we're looking at economic growth. So we're not harming the, the environment. We're doing the right things and taking advantages of those technologies that will allow us to, growth, uh, to, to grow. Um, <laughs> that allow us to grow, but do it in a sustainable way. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Thompson. Just a reminder, one ding is you've got 30 seconds left, and uh, 
multitudinous rings. You've had your time. All right, Councillor Paul West is next on the list, please. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, before I come on to what I was going to say, I, know, I, I think it was Councillor Scarf talking about um, his uh, business in his area. I just remind him that part of his team on the, the front bench, the, the Green Party uh, spokes uh, team, are actually in support of uh, banning advertising of alcohol products. So that's worth <laughs> bearing in mind, I think. <laughs> but, <laughs> But, that, but actually, if I can just follow on from what from what Councillor from what Councillor Thompson said a moment ago, um, in relation to what Councillor Lindsay, I think it was, he, he's who he mentioned growth as as though it's some kind of bad thing. I think we have got to try and um, have growth in a way that is sustainable, as Councillor Rout and others have indicated. But growth is not a bad thing. Growth is what. Um, many people in the country, my, some of my, con most of my constituents, I, I assume his and others, aspire to to make their own lives better, whether it's better homes, better jobs and opportunities, or better schools. And often, growth, the word growth, can be sort of um, said in a derisory way by those who already enjoy good homes, good jobs, and, and good opportunities. What we should be about is having sustainable growth so that others um, can, yeah. can join in that higher standard of living. And it's okay to talk about um, ground source heat pumps, but unless at this moment in time they're going to be paid for by the government, families who struggle to pay their heating bills and food bills, um, gr talking about installing ground source heat pumps is a completely different language. So whilst I don't disagree with you, Councillor Lindsay, that it is the way forward. It, re it requires more than just, I think, lecturing to people that they ought to go and get a ground source heat pump um, when many people can't afford their heating bill currently. Yeah. Chair, with, with your indulgence, Chair, I, I really must have a point of clarification on the Green Party policy about banning alcohol advertising. It's the second time I've heard it in a chamber. In our previous chamber, it was mentioned by the leader, Councillor Hicks. Uh, and of course, I'm not hugely familiar with every no uh, twist of Green Party national policy, but that po oh, it is, it is. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, and, and of course, that policy kicks in in the second term of a national Green government after, hang on, wait a minute, 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 after we've cut VAT from the entire alcohol sector. And I know the party opposite likes tax rises, but actually it forms part of a taxation cut. So just for clarification. <laughs> Councillor Andy Mellon, please. Um, your... Chance of the maiden speech, sir. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would just add a, a few rambling thoughts um, to what other members have, have said. Um, the, the second paragraph of the motion uh, ends with a, talking about um, economic and climate ambitions, but I think we need to acknowledge the fact that often these two things are in tension with one another. Um, when, what we're talking about when we say growth, we're talking about growth in gross domestic, domestic product, which economists are now thinking is a very, very rough and ready measurement of economic activity. The, the fact is that carbon emissions are not a side effect of economic activity. They are a direct central result, and it's been almost impossible to decouple emissions from activity. Unfettered economic growth creates wealth, yes, we acknowledge that, but it also undermines it by damaging the foundation on which it depends, i.e. the biosphere. As someone has said, the economy has to live within the ecology, but at the moment, the economy is destroying the ecology. Unending economic growth 
within a closed finite biosphere is a dangerous fantasy. And we need to think differently, and we don't need a Swedish teenager to tell us that. Thank you. Councillor Hudson, would you like to now speak, sir? Well, thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, I think I'd rather rely on the facts, actually. And th there's, a, there's, there's basically a lovely quote here from the uh, office magazine, The Spectator. The Greens want to end, quote, the pursuit of endless economic growth, unquote, which is a politician's way of saying we want all the people to be poorer. That is what the inevitable consequence of this woolly-headed motion would be. Not our motion, but the opposition that we've heard to. <laughs> the opposition are really... The opposition would really have us have people poorer. Yes, the green agenda is worthwhile. But remember this. This country is responsible for 1% of global pollution. That's too many. But this government and this council will put 100% effort into being the greenest county in this country. We will not do it by squashing jobs. We will not do it with some woolly-headed idea. We've got to get real. We've got to keep it green, and we'll do it in this administration. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, um, Councillor Hudson. And now, Councillor Richard Smith, it comes to you as seconder of the motion to speak, please. Chairman, thank you. And be before I get underway, can I congratulate many people who have and, spoken in the debate today, but particularly Councillor Thompson. Thank you very much indeed for your very wise words. Now, Chairman, I'm, I'm very pleased that the first motion being discussed by this council at the first meeting after our elections to be held back in this council chamber should be on this crucial topic of economic development. Following our election, I have to admit I was a little surprised to be offered a post back in Cabinet, but when it's explained that the responsibilities included economic development, I was keen to accept and also to reflect its importance by it becoming first in my title as Cabinet Member for Economic Development, Transport Strategy and Waste. Without economic development and greater wealth creation, we are consigned to stagnation and ultimate decline. But with the right policies to encourage our wonderful businesses throughout this county, we can achieve great things. Full employment, increasing wage levels, providing greater disposable income, and a welcome increase in skills levels and qualifications, all of which have widely felt benefits, which I'm sure I don't need to spell out any further. My party has always been regarded as the party of business. In local government, our levers to influence businesses are limited. And frankly, the best thing we can often do is to leave the business sector alone to get on with what it does best creating wealth and prosperity for the wider good. We mustn't be tempted to try and interfere in business processes or in the quantity of services provided, although the quality of those services is of legitimate interest to us. And the business sector often is best served by us just getting out of their way. Although this authority does not play a major role in planning processes, these should be simple and be as rapidly completed as possible and be there to encourage, not to hinder, our industrial wealth creators. And as far as transport goes, and here I speak wearing a different hat, that of transport strategy, we need a true 21st century infrastructure fit for near-term as well as longer-term demands, mainly through the excellent Ford planning and ever-growing influence of Transport East, a regional body whose staff are based in this building, I'm confident we'll gain the ear of central government and attract the large-scale investments that we need into road, rail, and other enhancements to promote all aspects of economic development. 
Now, in their speeches, both the leader and the deputy leader of the council mentioned the Freeport East initiative. The success of this scheme is crucial to much of Suffolk's medium-term growth prospects. A great deal of work is taking place now here within the small but effective economic development team who are working hard against a tight timetable to deliver an interim business case on which the government will start to base future funding ideas. Next year, a full and detailed business case will be required and funding decisions should start flowing in 2023. From that scheme, it's obvious that the port of Felixstowe will benefit, as indeed the UK's major port should do. But the wider benefits will also prove significant, especially along the A14 corridor, which joins into the new aspirations for the Oxford to Cambridge arc, a term that we'll all hear more of in the, new, in the near future. Now, I haven't time, alas, to highlight many of Suffolk's other success stories. But some of our business success areas are mentioned in the motion, not alas tourism, and I think that was a mistake of mine because I think we do need to recognise tourism, but there are very many others that could have been listed as well. We know who they are and where they are and what they are, and they truly do range across the length and breadth of our special county. Let us all be proud of them. Let's encourage their growth and the entrepreneurial spirit that goes with it. With it. Let us encourage businesses to get on with what it does best and let us be on the sidelines with our own and central government initiatives playing their part to encourage and recognise the part this crucial sector plays helping to ensure the future prosperity of not just Suffolk, not just the East of England, but UK PLC as a whole. I'm proud to second this motion. It deserves unanimous support yeah, across yeah. the <laughs> Very much, Councillor Smith. Um, Councillor Andrew Stringer, please, to give the opposition spokesperson's view. Thank you, Chair. Uh, before I get into the main part of my speech, I voted to help you and assist you with your charity, uh, but I will pledge to mend a puncture on your bicycle when you're fundraising, Chair. <laughs> uh, the, uh, this motion is quite timely for us in the, in the week that my sector of Suffolk uh, had its transport to what was Otley College, Suffolk Rural College, cut. Uh, so you can't get to the skills centre that will teach you to brick lay and all those agricultural services from my section of Suffolk because of cuts to our bus service. So I hope we can take something from this motion and, and reverse that cut. Uh, as we hopefully do emerge, though, from the COVID-19 pandemic, it, it presents us with, I believe, a unique opportunity and a chance to rebuild our economic future for the benefit of all while within our environmental means. This opportunity will require us to rethink and challenge the models of the past and learn from history and the best minds from now help us craft the best future for us all. Solely using economic growth, not development, economic growth as your aim is simply too simplistic for the challenges we face. Historically introduced by politicians as a measure of economic activity, building and populating a new prison adds to growth. An oil tanker spilling its load off our coast adds to growth. An accident Chernobyl added significant growth to the Ukrainian economy. Because we've doggedly pursued never-ending economic growth is the single biggest reason we faced our declared climate emergency. A declaration pro proposer uh, of the motion voted for, but sadly the second are voted against. But our politicians like, do like rampant economic growth, as it can help to disguise tax rises. But the resultant boom and bust cycles have been utter disasters. But during these dire economic times, debt collectors and bailiffs proliferated, adding to economic growth. This clearly demonstrates that not all economic growth is good, and this motion enshrines that all economic growth is good. The motion also includes the phrase UK PLC. I had to look up the definition. It basically means all of the commercial community as a single organisation. 
So the UK PLC may have an array of economic ambitions, but it certainly doesn't have a collective climate ambition. So basically, the, the, fun, the, the, the motion is fundamentally flawed. It's basically an oxymoron. Uh, so I, I won't be supporting it, sadly. Uh, does that make me anti-business? Does that make me anti-aspiration? Uh, Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Uh, it, it, it's, the motion suggests that our climate uh, emergency plans restrict economic futures. Absolutely not. Stone market car-based charging manufacturer, EO, was sold three weeks ago to an American company for £124 million. Best of luck to them. And I hope they reinvest that money in the town that they made it in, which was Stowe Market. Uh, what we desperately need is an economic model that delivers for the needs of all while living within the bounds of the planet's resources. And that economic model exists, even if I can't say it. It's basically called donut economics. I'm surprised it wasn't in the motion. In fact, if we could have not socially distanced, we would be handing out donuts right now. <laughs> It means donut economics, please look it up, I haven't got time to go into it in detail, but it means that everyone within the circle of that donut gets all that they need in terms of to thrive. But the world's resources are on the outer part of the donut. So you need to keep your economy within the edible part of the donut. If not, you are, if you are in trouble, uh, which, we, which we indeed are. That brings me to wealth. Definition of wealth is an abundance of valuable possessions or money, an abundance. Uh, when we look at any motion from the administration, we take it very, very seriously, which we tried to work with you and very quickly to suggest some amendments, but it's not a problem. Those of you who know me closer will know I've just become a proud grandfather. I've got a granddaughter called Paloma. Absolutely gorgeous. Uh, I, can't, I, can't, uh, I can't wait till her mother, my daughter, expresses some milk and I can bring her into the chamber. Anyway, uh, am I denying her... Uh, and you can all see her. Uh, I'm a proud grandfather and I want to help out. So, but am I denying her a, a huge future if I vote against this? No, what I wish for her is not abundance. I wish for her just enough of everything she wants while she treads as lightly on this earth as she can. I will not vote for this motion. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Stringer. Moving on now to Councillor Hicks. Do you have any further you wish to add? You have five minutes in which to do so. I won't take five minutes, Mr Chairman. Uh, do you know, it's really interesting listening to the debate today and, and hearing the differing views. And do you know, this motion is about actually just a few simple things. And it's, I'm, I'm really surprised we haven't got a unanimous uh, vote on this. So it's about actually having ambition for our county. It's about supporting our businesses. It's about supporting our residents. And it's about supporting UK PLC come out of a pandemic. Why is that so difficult? I really think we should be getting behind this motion and there should be unanimous support. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Hicks. We're now moving to the electronic vote. Don't press anything on your touch screen yet. Then, if you support the motion, please press yes. If you do not agree with the motion, press no. And press abstain if you wish to abstain. And you press four if you want to do something else. But are you all ready, please? We will start the vote. Please vote now. Has everyone voted, please? Can everyone see your vote has been cast on their screen? No objections to that? Thank you very much. I'm going to close the vote. And there are the results. We have 43-4. Oops, this gone. That's better. 47-4, 12, ag uh, 12 against, and no abstentions. And there's 59 of us here, so that's good. All adds up. Okay, moving on now to uh, motion two, and I invite Councillor Robert Win uh, Lindsay to propose motion two. Councillor Lindsay.
Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, I've got a bit of paper in my hand. It's a Conservative Yay! manifesto. I recognise that. <laughs> a lovely document it is. Um, uh, and uh, it, it really does make a change for me to be waving it rather than someone on the other side. But um, I just want to refer you to this little bit here. Um, we have identified over £20 million of upgrades to our cycle network. Um, and the government wants you to double cycling and walking. They've said in their gear change document which came out about a year ago. And as we all know, we've set a target here at the County Council uh, for getting to carbon zero by 2030. So it's logical, therefore, to push for that doubling that the government wants, and we all want, I hope, of cycling and walking, to be met by 2030. Uh, and use this 20 million that you've identified um, to get there. Um, consultants, Ricardo, have already told the Suffolk Climate Partnership, um, but of which we're a part, and um, uh, with, with funding they used from, from the um, leaders group, uh, that a sensible path to zero in transport in Suffolk by 2030 would require car journeys in this county to halve by that date. The only way to do that is to ensure that people have low carbon travel alternatives, like cycling, walking and buses, so that they can leave the car at home. But if we're ever to reach, that's a really ambitious goal, if we're ever to reach it, we have to have smart targets, not just one target for 2030, but actions and measurable outcomes along the way to 2030. No, I'm, I know we don't have a crystal ball, I'm sure Councillor Smith will tell us um, that we don't have a crystal ball, I know that. We can't tell what government grant will be offered when. But if we don't set annual targets, we will have no incentive to seek, to actively go out, seek to raise that money year by year. And we've got to do that if we're to get there. So please honour the promises you made to voters in this bit of paper. Don't just spell out the costs of cycling investment, but set out a timetable plan to spend the money that you say you've identified. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Stringer. Do you have a seconder, please? Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm going to open the debate. And we have Councillor Harley, we have Councillor Kemp. You wish to speak for the opposition? Right now. Go for it. Thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. I'm, I'm grateful to um, Robert for giving us the opportunity to talk about our, um, our excellent manifesto. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> reminding us all how, how good it is, um, as if the number of us here wasn't already reminder, reminder enough. <laughs> um, and also to talk about um, the excellent work this administration is doing to promote modal shift and, and cycling. Although I, I do slightly wonder whether he's read his, his own motion. He's talking about a timetable, um, but earlier he was talking about the, the, the budget. So that's what I'd like to address, address first, finances, budget setting, and the capital program. As I've had said previously, neither the, the budget nor the capital program um, is set piecemeal with ad hoc decisions in full council meetings. It's set in the round, balancing sets of demands and needs against each other. Adding £20 million of borrowing to our capital programme to, to cover the upgrades identified without removing anything else would add over £1 million per year for 30 years to our revenue budget. There is no suggestion at all other than a, a reference to grant funding where that £1 million per annum, annum would come from, nor is there any suggestion um, of what alternatively might, might make way to cover the costs. As ever, the Green Party seems to be very good at spending money without saying where it would come from. Yeah, yeah. I hope it's printed on recycled paper. It's an awful lot of printing for a start. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, should I, should, I should stress, the capital programme is in the process of being reviewed, looking at the, expending, at the expected spending profile of individual schemes and any forecasting spend pressures that may occur due to things like increasing labour costs. But, Mr Chairman, the rationale for having these identified shovel-ready schemes is not to place undue pressure on the Suffolk taxpayer 
or risk this council's finances, but rather to draw down on funding streams as they become available. In order to bid for funding, we must have schemes identified, and this is something we've done successfully to date. The Cycling PDP, when it identified these schemes, pointed to the Integrated Transport Block, Section 106, SIL, and future government initiatives. In 2021 alone, we drew in over 1.6 million in capital funding by the Active Travel Fund and Emergency Active Travel Fund for a number of schemes on the priority list. Over the same period, over £400,000 of revenue was committed to encouraging cycling. A second bid for round two of the Active Travel Fund of nearly 4.8 million has now been lodged. We're waiting on the announcement of whether this has been successful, but the bid includes schemes on the priority list, such as 1.7 million for Wood the Woodbridge Road Active Travel Corridor, 1.56 million for the Nacton Road Active Travel Corridor, nearly half a million for Princess Street, <coughs> and similar amounts for schemes on Normanston Drive and Finborough Road. Mr Chairman, this is just round two of the funding and future rounds are anticipated. The DFT have suggested that we may not have to bid for funding going forward and potentially <coughs> excuse me, we will be provided with a three year settlement based on previous year's funding. As it stands, we have not assumed any borrowing to cover these schemes. As I said, to do so could place undue strain on the Suffolk taxpayer and an additional one million pounds per annum to cover the revenue pressures. We on this side of the chamber feel that this undue pressure on the Suffolk taxpayer when grant funding could reasonably and indeed has been available. Perhaps Councillor Lindsay or another member of the opposition will clarify whether they want additional borrowing or a timetable or a budgetary amendment um, or, or, or clarify their, their, their motion but they don't seem to, to understand it themselves. I would stress on the budget, making a commitment today is not how we set budgets. Pressures need to be measured against one another. That's why we set a balanced budget and have a budget debate. This administration is committed to cycling. It is committed to modal shift and has long stated its aspirations around the environment. But we're also committed to sound financial management. Yeah. Part and parcel of sound financial management is preparedness. The point of having these schemes ready and identified is to apply for funding and ensure the council does not foot the bill alone. We will be opposing this motion as it is our belief that we can deliver real change and real improvements to our cycle network in line with our manifesto without placing undue pressure on the Suffolk taxpayer. That is why we have the, the cycling PDP and that is why we will continue to bid for the required funding and deliver modal shift in our county. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Routon. Apologies for turning over two pages here and, uh, and not inviting you to, uh, to speak at that point. Um, but we will now open the debate, and Councillor Harley is the first to speak, please. Councillor Harley. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, my constituents on the Shotley Peninsula are very poorly served by cycle routes and have to cycle along the busy and dangerous A137 and B1456, as I did this morning. I think your chairman had a much safer route from Felixstowe, by the way. Um, the, the Shotley Peninsula Cycling Campaign have identified a bridleway that will connect many of the villages. Um, uh, is already a legal route to cycle on, but yet the surface is too poor, especially in winter, for this to be practical. Um, and um, highways so far have not been able to um, help with that. Can the administration tell me when the funds are to be spent on the identified upgrades required uh, to be, allow this to be a practical cycle route? Um, agreeing and acting on this motion will, will allow me to tell my residents when this will be possible. And I, personally, I think it will cost a lot less than gullwing bridges, for example. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Harley. And now, Councillor Richard Kent, please. Thank you, Chairman. I won't labour the point. I have the leaflet as well. Uh, uh, I'm sure you're ready to break your election promises. We've seen all over the place. Uh, but anyway, I won't labour that point. Uh, success story. After potholes, after flooding, all the other complaints you get, I was pleased to take out the news from you over there that you had identified 137 cycle routes in Suffolk, and indeed they would be done within the next 
five years. That was two years ago. So where have they got to, please? Uh, will you identify a programme so I can uh, calm my parishioners down? Because they're expecting these things to happen soon. So I'm not going to comment any further. It's down to you. You are the ones who made the promises. I just translated those promises to my constituents and they're saying to me, Councillor Kemp, can you ask Suffolk County Council what they're up to with the 137 cycle routes? Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Kemp. Next on the list is Councillor Lockington, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And um, it is right that if you read something that says, we have identified over 20 million of upgrades for our cycle route network. If I, as a resident, read things like that, I would expect that to be true, that actually there was that identified sum of money. But now we hear that, oh, well, if we get it, you know, we might get some grants or something. If you put in that you already have identified the money, you would actually expect it to be there. Ah, so you didn't say that, no? Well, but I would like to bid for some of that. Some of it would be really good spent to for secure cycle places so that when we take our bikes to work, when you take them to where you want to go, you can leave your bike somewhere because it's not only about the cycling, because if we want people to cycle to things, we actually need to be sure that they have somewhere really secure that they can leave their bikes. So that must be part of your plan. And also, we would like you to look at how you measure success, because it's no good like what happened on Valley Road with all the plastic ones there. You know, you uh, put the plastic ones out. Nobody would have a clue who, how many people used the bikes before or used the bike line before. Then a little bit later, we see the traffic count go up and then the traffic count go away again. It would be really interesting to know how you measure the success of things because I think that is really important for us that we get people cycling. And also, cycling is very good for us. I'm sure Councillor Hoffensperger will really agree with us that an other health spokesperson that cycling is excellent. My elderly mum, when she was alive, she could not walk very well, but she could ride her bicycle. I must admit, in the village when she came, my sister who lived in the same village actually turned around when she saw my mum because she said she's probably quite a danger on, on her bicycle. But it meant that mum could get out and about. We also need to think about our pedestrians and we need to think about our footpaths. There are many things we need to think about to get healthier. And we need to think about good footpaths for disabled people, so our people with disabilities can get out in nature the same as you and I can. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Lockington. Moving on to uh, Councillor Caroline Page, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have to say, I'm rather astonished by um, Councillor Routes' cake and eat it approach to funding cycling. I can't remember being on the Cycling PDP in order not to spend money. I remember being on it to solve the problems of cycling. Now, if funding cycling is just aspirational, your intention to half the car journeys can't really be taken very seriously. We've got to half them by 2030. Now, my, that, that's a sideline, actually. The difficulty of cycling between our market towns exists because there is so little available road space that can be cycled safely, a situation that has remained unchanged for decades. 
Off-road options with bridleways exist cross-country, and there are many areas of hidden, overgrown routes beside the A12. We need money. It's clear many rural cyclists will be enabled to travel between market towns with effective support and smart targets. And these smart targets are needed to achieve this as soon as possible. We can't wait for money to appear from somewhere, possibly, yeah? Action now is needed to ensure we meet our 2030 target for halving car journeys. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Page. I've only got one more, oh, I've got two more speakers now, because I've got Councillor Wellham, but I've also got Caroline, Councillor Caroline Topping. Uh, any more speakers? Councillor Bird wishes to speak as well. And uh, then we will come to the, <clears throat> to the um, seconder and the winding up. So Councillor Caroline Topping is next. Thank you, Chair. I wasn't intending to speak, but having heard everybody else speak, I thought I would just make my maiden speech as well. I've been driving since I was 18 years old. I'm now 54. I know you can't believe it, but I am. Um, I decided five years ago to give up my car, so I haven't actually owned a car for the last five years. <laughs> that was before I actually joined the Green Party, I might add. Um, I now do all my council um, meetings on public transport or by cycle. So I arrived here today by train from Beckles. Um, we had a bit of an incident a few weeks ago when, as an East Suffolk councillor, we had our meeting at High Lodge in Darsham. I had to make a decision. There was three options. Three councillors from Beckles had to get to High Lodge at Darsham. The first option was to take my husband's car because, yes, my husband does drive a car and it is diesel, sorry. Option two was to actually get a taxi from Halesworth to come out and meet me at Darsham train station, where I would cycle from Beckles, from my home, to Beckles train station, catch the train to Darsham, and then get a taxi to come from Halesworth to collect me at Darsham train station to take me to High Lodge, and then come back and repeat the journey later. That would have actually accrued two miles more than me actually taking my husband's car and driving myself and two colleagues from Beckles to Darsham. Or we actually, which we, uh, what we actually did was we cycled to the train station, took three bikes on the train from Beckles to Darsham. Unfortunately, the train was too long and we had to carry the cycles down a carriage because the um, train was too long to actually open the doors at Darsham, but that's another story. Where I was reliably informed there was a cycle path and a footpath, which I think is in Councillor Smith's ward, thank you, to get me from Darsham train station safely, because I was terrified of the A12, cycling on the A12, to High Lodge for my council meeting. So this is what we chose to do. We did the cycle footpath, we went across, we went across the other footpath, but unfortunately we couldn't find the footpath on the other side of the road because it was totally overgrown and covered in brambles. We were actually all in skirts at the time because we were going for a photo opportunity at High Lodge and we literally got torn to shreds by the brambles and the nettles. So the moral of the story is we need to spend money <laughs> on maintaining the cycle paths. I have got to say, I did, when we got to High Lodge, go on to my Suffolk County Council reporting tool and actually reported to our um, wonderful uh, members of staff that there wasn't an issue and two weeks later when I was actually transferring that going along that road in a car but I wasn't driving um, I had noticed it had been cut but has not been cut back far enough so we do need to spend some money on these cycle paths we do need people to think about leaving their cars behind cycling and using public transport thank you <laughs> I think the, the one thing about that story, ladies and gentlemen, is it's a very long walk from Darsham Station to High Lodge. <laughs> uh, I can actually vouch for that. Good. Right, moving on. Councillor Wellham, please. Thank you, Chair. How do I follow that? Um, having listened to speakers on the other side, I'm now uncertain whether or not the administration has committed or will commit any part of the £20 million to be funded from the ca county's capital programme. Council wrote, called out a lot of numbers, so much spent here, so much spent there. But is this, <coughs> is this administration committing any capital funds? If so, when and on what schemes? And when can we expect 
completion of the partially complete cycle routes. There are a number in, across the county that are partially complete. They, they need completing too. And when will, when will funds be sufficient to fund the, the maintenance of the routes that do exist? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Wellen. And then Councillor Stuart Byrne, please. Yes, thank you, Mr Chairman. I'll be as brief as I can. This, this motion talks about um, cycling and walking. I, I'm, I'm a keen walker myself. I enjoy walking. I, I particularly enjoyed walking earlier this year in April and May. I walked down 225 fine road streets and, and lanes in my fine division. It was an enjoyable experience because I was delivering leaflets for my election campaign, standing <laughs> under the under the Conservative manifesto mentioned by the party opposite. I would just say to the, the Greens and the Lib Dems, they could have enjoyed the same experience delivering leaflets in my fine division, but you didn't bother fielding a candidate in my division, <laughs> did you? Um, you, you? You asked the people of Suffolk to have faith in you when you don't seem to even have enough faith in yourselves to field a candidate in my division. Thank you. Councillor Stringer, you have reserved your right. Would you like to now speak? Yes, yes, I would, Chair. Yeah. Thank you. Settle down now. I just want to put on the record that... I, not to make the House too uh, rebellious, I, I just want to put on record I've never cycled through brambles while wearing a dress. Uh, so we can put that one to bed. Um, I, just thought I, would, I just thought I would start uh, with a quote from a parish council chairman who wrote to me actually today. Uh, we included in the report the motion that we're putting forward today. Uh, I, I quite like the contents of the report. Reading the County Council's response to the climate issue, I see little commitment in actually doing something. It will be interesting to see a detailed action plan with targets, actions and measurable outcomes. And he's going to be unkind about you now. I suspect the current administration are out of their depths on this issue. Now, I was hoping to go back to that meeting tonight to say, no, actually, they've committed to do what they said while pounding the streets, putting out the message that they had identified £20 million to improve our cycle network. Because when I pounded the streets, an awful lot of my uh, people that did end up voting for me, but a lot of people did say, well, why do we need a Green Party? Because they're pledged to spend £20 million quid on the cycle network. The public thought that meant that was a pledge to deliver. And to be honest, that's not unreasonable. But, but what you have been is really clever with your language. Well done. A lot of those lights that have been switched on, thinking we were going to do something and being clear and committed to it, have now gone out, which I actually regret. We gave you an opportunity today with this motion to actually commit. So what that should have said there, we've identified over £20 million worth of upgrades to our cycle network, but it should have carried on by saying, subject to government finance, your investment in cycle route may go up as well as down, blah de blah de blah <laughs> And by the way, we probably won't maintain it. You know, there is, there, is, there is being fast and loose with the English language, and I frankly think that one just stepped a little too far. And we've given you that opportunity today to try and rectify that by being in line with your own government's aspirations to deliver modal shift, and you can't do that. Okay, fair enough. Uh, but at least we could put something in the budget. We could have put £100 in the budget for next year, and we didn't. And there's no clear timetable. That, I regret, I'm going to have to report tonight when I go back to, to see this gentleman, uh, and to say that there has been no commitment and no timetable to deliver on the modal shift that your government have committed you to. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Stringer, do you, want, do you want to speak, Councillor Murray, because um, we pretty well closed the debate there, but if there is an important point yeah. to add, please go. Um, I'm not sure whether it's a point of order or a point of clarification. I'm not sure what the title is, but I do believe that we have a responsibility not to mislead anyone that's watching. So would it be possible for Councillor Stringer to actually read out the specific wording on our manifesto? Because I do believe that there have been a number of people on your side that have misrepresented what the specific words of our manifesto was. I'm happy to do that, Chair. Okay, then let's go ha then. Happy to do that. The wording said, we have identified 
over £20 million of upgrades to our cycle network. So, so what you meant was you'd identified potential upgrades that need funding, but not identified the money. So would you like to then read out what identified actually means for the definition, or are you happy just because you've clarified that? I think we better close uh, the debate there, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Councillor Lindsay, uh, you have the opportunity to sum up now for your, for your proposal. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, what a shame. A lot of weasel words, really, from the, from the other side there. Um, undue pressure on the Suffolk taxpayer. Um, of course, when it came to building a third road bridge in Lowestoft, which will create untold traffic, untold carbon emissions, we, this council borrowed more money than we've ever borrowed before. 65 million quid we're in hock for that bridge. We'll be paying it back for at least 25 years. It's going to be a huge part of our budget to build one road bridge. We're talking about £20 million pounds. You're not even prepared to commit. Um, you, you've, you've refused, not only have you refused to timetable spending by year just, by, just now, you're also refusing to commit to spending it even by 2030, over eight years. And not only that, you're refusing to commit to spending it at all. You've put it in your bloody manifesto, but you sort of, pardon that, you put it here, we have identified over 20 million of upgrades to our cycle network, and, and what it should say after that, that we are not prepared to spend any of it um, because, uh, because of pressures. We don't want to put the to suffer taxpayer under undue pressure. Uh, I, I'll leave it there. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, Councillor Lindsay. Um, thank you, everybody, for your contributions on this. I now propose to move to the electronic vote. Don't touch your touch screen yet. If you, I will open the vote. If you support the motion, press yes. If you do not agree with the motion, press no. Press abstain if you wish to abstain. Are you all ready? We'll start the vote. Please vote now. Has everybody voted? In which case I'm going to close the vote. And there is the outcome there. 17-4, the proposal, 42 against it, so I'm afraid to say that motion is lost. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it's now four o'clock. Um, we have at least one hour's business to do now because uh, we, we need to take the, the health and safety report and then we have questions to cabinet members. Um, would you like to take a break at this point or do you wish to soldier on? We have a 10 minute break then. Thank you very much.
Councillors, if I can um, ask you to return to your places, please, so we can get underway. Councillors, can we now move on to agenda item eight, please, which is a report by the Executive Director of Corporate Services and the Deputy Chief Executive. I call on Councillor Reid to move the recommendation. Councillor Reid. Uh, thank you. I, I would quite like to wait for my seconder, if that was OK. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I was That's delayed fine. by cake. Oh, are you seconding? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Your seconder is in the chamber, um, Councillor Reid. Just not seated yet. Um, Councillor Spicer. Councillor Spicer. Oh, can somebody tap on the door? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and, and thank you for um, allowing councillors to decompress after those two motions before this extremely interesting item that I'm bringing before you. Quite right. Uh, and this annual safety, health, uh, and well-being report, uh, approved and endorsed by the council's corporate leadership team uh, last month, uh, provides an overview uh, of the progress that Suffolk County Council uh, it has made in its. Uh, safety, health and well-being strategy for the last three years. The report for 2020-2021 uh, is found in your papers at Appendix A. As you will see, you have been provided with a revised Table 5, for page 15, on incident data, as the wrong table was originally included. Today, I am asking you to acknowledge the progress that has been made in the 2020 to 2021 financial year, uh, and to note the award mentioned in the report, the Gold Medal reward, uh, Award in Occupational Health and Safety from the Royal Society for the Prevention of Accidents. As the report states, this is in recognition of achieving six consecutive gold awards. This is a clear demonstration of the ongoing pro progress that we are making, which is acknowledged by ROSPA. Furthermore, it is important to recognise that our health, safety and well-being procedures and practices have kept us largely healthy, safe and well uh, in the last year, at a time of the global pandemic. Whilst it is recognised that Suffolk generally has fared well, the County Council has not had significant COVID-19 outbreaks and reduced levels uh, of absence, isolation and sickness. There has been significant support for staff, both working from home uh, and those that undertake work in the community. This has resulted in improved health, safety and well-being, engagement and communication, evidenced through the positive responses uh, in the most recent staff survey. However, the virus is very much with us uh, and we cannot afford to be complacent. We continue to identify and mitigate this uh, and all other workplace hazards through proportionate and practical control measures. The Shaw team under, under Mike Leake, the new head of health and safety, recognises that there is still more to do. There are still areas to be improved and there is a programme of activity to address these issues this year. We recognise the importance that health, safety, health and well-being, as to the part of our commitment to it, we will be introducing mandatory training for all colleagues to support the development of the safety, health and well-being culture in Suffolk County Council. Soon, Scrutiny will be looking at staff, health and well-being and will make recommendations which the Shaw Board will factor into the review of the Shaw strategy for 2022 to 2025. Alongside that review, 
uh, and recognizing the fact that our shore performance measures need to be reviewed and refreshed, I will be working with the shore team to take this forward over the next year. I commend the annual report to you and trust that the Council will recognize the good work done in the past year. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Reid. Do you have a seconder, please? Uh, I Spicer. Thank you very much. Councillor Spicer, do you wish uh, to speak now? Chairman, thank you very much. I would like to second this, and I would reserve my right to speak, if I may. Thank you very much. Councillor Simon Harley, your spokesman for the opposition. Uh, you can speak for five minutes at any time during this debate. Do you want to speak now? Okay, let's go. Uh, thank you, Chair and Councillor Reid, and good afternoon, Council. Uh, you'll forgive me some trepidation as a newcomer in, in speaking again, actually, to this august body. Um, it's good to see how seriously the Council takes safety, health and well-being, and the progress made in the period of this report, especially as the uh, period includes that of the COVID pandemic, um, a public health emergency not seen before in our lifetimes. Um, as opposition, our job is to scrutinise and hold to account. However, in this report, there's little obvious to criticise beyond the mathematics in the original Table 5, but I'm pleased to see, having pointed this out, that it's now been corrected. Incident data in Table 4 shows a significant reduction in incidents from 2019 to 20. Um, however, this isn't surprising given the fact that for much of this time, people were at home and unable to go to work or school. I note that in uh, Table 3, absence data, uh, the number of days lost to work is down from the previous year, um, although the number of sickness incidents is actually increased, um, which appears to be as a result of increase in staff absence due to mental health issues, which again one can speculate is likely to be as a result of the pressures resulting from the pandemic. Um, this underlines the importance of support of people's mental health, which I know that the Council takes very seriously. Uh, I'm pleased to see that further work is being undertaken to support mental health through awareness sessions and embedding this into management practice. I'm pleased to see also that the Council uh, takes very seriously the environmental impact of travel and taking into consideration the new ways of working uh, will create opportunities to significantly reduce the need for travel when undertaking such training events. Personally speaking, I found the recent induction programme over Teams uh, was easy to access and fulfilled many of my learning needs without needing to travel, and I know this has been beneficial for many of my colleagues too. I attended the health and safety training induction module and found this most informative, um, pertinent and surprisingly enjoyable, and I would encourage those 26 councillors who have not yet attended to join a catch-up session that I believe is being organised soon as we discussed in the last uh, councillor development group meeting this week. You know who you are. I, know, I, I note that e-learning modules for managers on the corporate indicators on table one shows low performance, and I trust that uh, progress will be made in this indicator by, ne by next year. Um, the lagging indicators on table two indicate some progress also needs to be made in uh, new referrals to occupational health um, and return to work interviews. Um, hopefully face-to-face -face courses will also be possible in the near future. Um, it's fantastic uh, news, and I concur with Councillor Reid, um, uh, that the uh, Council has been awarded the gold medal uh, by the Royal Society for Prevention of Accidents as a result of the six consecutive gold awards. Um, and I'm sure we're all joining this in uh, celebrating this as a, all joining celebrating this as a, a mark of the work done by, the, by this Council um, in safety, health and wellbeing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Harley. I will now open the debate. If you wish to speak, uh, please signal that you wish to do so and wait for confirmation that your signal has been received by the monitoring officer. Each speaker in the debate has up to three minutes to speak. And I have Councillor Caroline Page on that list, but no others at the moment. So, oh, there's Councillor James Finch over there. Thank you very much. So, Councillor Page. Thank you, Chair. Um, <laughs> yes, I can. I'm bilocational, I am. <laughs> when looking at staff ill health over the last year, two questions come to mind. 
Firstly, do we know how the Bradford factor, which is adopted on the 1st of April 2019, how that's affected the statistics? And secondly, has the appearance of long COVID been factored into the Bradford factor algorithm? And I can see everyone going, what's the Bradford factor? <laughs> If you, want, if you want some information on the Bradford factor, it's a, it's a, a kind of a sum which sums up the, uh, sums up the, uh, um, let me see, I've got it in front of me here, if I can find it, I've moved, moved things, sums up day sick, okay, and we adopted it to discourage people from being sick. Okay, you done, Councillor Page? Yes. Yeah, right, thank you very much. I'm, I'm sure that will be taken up in the response to, uh, to the debate. So, Councillor James Finch next, please. Councillors, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I wasn't planning to speak on this, but I just felt it was important to recognise, as has been mentioned by Councillor Reid, um, the fact that uh, this council has taken mental health very seriously. And I'd like to particularly thank those members of staff that have taken up the opportunity to go and um, have mental health awareness and training to support their fellow colleagues. Um, as you mentioned in your opening remarks, um, mental health um, was very important to me personally and um, the council themselves have been working alongside over the last two or three years alongside Suffolk Mind. And so um, I think it's an excellent example of some, uh, some of our colleagues to actually perpetuate this. And I think we will recognize that this should continue going forward after the 18 months we've just been through. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Finch. Are there any other councillors who wish to speak to this? Councillor Ladd, thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Chair. I'm glad you remembered my name. Uh, I, just, I had mental block there for a minute, I do beg your pardon. <laughs> I wasn't going to speak on this matter like Councillor Finch really, but uh, I think Councillor Reid did mention scrutiny looking at uh, uh, the health and wellbeing of staff, and I just wanted to mention that uh, on the 30th September, scrutiny will be looking at that aspect, but it will be concentrating mainly on the impact of home working on the health and wellbeing of staff. So uh, there will be papers out in the next sort of couple, couple of weeks for that, so I think if members are interested, <coughs> Uh, please look at that because it's an important factor I think that we need to be aware <coughs> particularly of something new which has uh, come to staff uh, and members actually over the last 18 months of, of working from home and the impacts that has positive and negative so we'll be looking at that in detail but can I just commend also uh, th this report because uh, uh, it, it often I think it's not given enough airspace because it's probably one of the most important reports that comes to this council and it probably doesn't get enough space that it should um, and obviously getting the gold award from ROSPA you know it, that's some achievement they don't hand them out uh, uh, easily so that's some achievement so congratulations to uh, all of the staff involved in that it's, it, it's, it's good news and this is a great report thank you chairman I don't think there are any other councillors wanting to speak, so I'm going to call on Councillor Joanna Spicer now to second the proposal. Thank you, Chairman. I have to say, if you told someone you were going to be making a speech on health and safety to full council, they would either direct you to a book full of jokes about health and safety, or they'd tell you about how they got held up in some tiresome roadworks with barriers just because one pothole was being filled. So I was pretty pleased to look at this, and it's not even called health and safety anymore. It's called safety, health and well-being. And what I'm pleased talking to people, reading the report and listening today, and thank you um, all who've spoken, to notice that emphasis on well-being, um, both of our staff and the services from the services we provide. Um, and just to follow on, uh, thank you, Councillor Harley, with your... Made second made in second speech today um, for giving a plug for health and safety um, training for members. It's actually the 27th of October. So do put that in your diaries because it is, it, it's very important. 
Uh, like Councillor Reid and others, I would want to add my praise and thanks to the staff of this organisation led by our Chief Executive for how they've responded um, to the challenges to health, safety and well-being from the COVID pandemic, um, and particularly um, picking out those staff working from home, staff in schools, the advice and support we were able to give to care homes and, uh, and those uh, working for us providing care, um, so important. Now, what is uh, good in terms of the next steps is that scrutiny is already starting the process of looking at this, which I think is excellent. Um, I, I was um, read very carefully the priorities for the look going forward, which are on page 18 of the report, page 38. Um, and one of those that um, is listed there is about support from working from home. So I would urge the scrutiny committee when they look at it, not just to look at what we've done, but to come up with some both suggestions and support for action plan to take forward the work um, that's outlined in here. Um, so with those few comments, and again, um, uh, well done to all concerned. Uh, welcome to our new Head of Health and Safety Expertise watching somewhere um, and to assure him of the support from this council for all matters relating to safety, health and well-being. And with that, Chairman, um, I would second this report and ask members to, I hope, unanimously support it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Spicer. I'm going to invite Councillor Reid now as proposer of the motion. Do you have anything to add, please? Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman, and, and thank you for all those who have uh, contributed to this discussion, um, in particular Councillor Harley um, for his constructive comments. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, there is a great deal, as I said, of work that uh, our new Head of Health and Safety wishes to do, uh, and I'm looking forward to working with him uh, to achieve that. Uh, to Councillor uh, Page's point in introducing a question around the use of the Bad Bradford factor as a, a form of measure for absenteeism, I understand that that is going to be considered by scrutiny, uh, and we will of course consider that as being an, a, another measure that may be employed. Uh, but thank you all, and I commend this, uh, this report uh, to, the, to the Council. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Reid. Um, is it the wish of Council that we agree these recommendations by general affirmation? Is there any objector to doing that? Good, okay, I see no hands raised. Recommendations are therefore carried. And we're going to move on to agenda item nine, which is cabinet members' reports and questions. Please remember that each councillor can only ask one main question and one supplementary. Uh, time limit for responses to questions is two minutes. Four questions allowed in advance have been received from councillors. And the first question, I think, was originated by Councillor Otten, but who's not here today, so Councillor Page is going to uh, write, write, read the question. Councillor Page. You're getting quite a lot of me today, aren't you? Um, so, I think this is possibly, it's a question to the leader of council or relevant cabinet member, is what it says. It might be for uh, Councillor Reid, yeah. The menopause is a natu natural state of life but can lead to long-term changes in physical and emotional health for all women. It's rarely discussed. What support does the council and its partners have in place to help and advise? Councillor Reid, please. Well, um, thank you, Mr Chairman, and thank you, Councillor Page, for asking the, the question on behalf of Councillor Rotten. Uh, the needs of women in Suffolk experiencing the menopause has already been identified as a priority by the County Council, NHS, Public Serv Health Services, uh, through listening to the voices of residents, practitioners, locally and nationally. At a national level, Public Health England will be publishing later this year a women's reproductive health programme. This programme will include specific actions related to the menopause, a key element of which is equitable access to support and treatment, regardless of sexual orientation and trans status. Initiatives to support women going through the menopause are broad, and range from peer and facilitated support groups, such as menop menop menopause cafes, through to clinical services, 
for those experiencing distressing symptoms. Action has and is being taken to improve the experience of those going through the menopause. In particular, Public Health Suffolk is playing an active role in driving forward service improvement in relation to the menopause. This is an integral focus within the Sexual and Reproductive Health Transformation Programme, which is a collaborative effort uh, with provider services, CCGs, NHS England, public, and Public Health England, uh, and of course the voluntary sector and service users. The Transformation Programme is underpinned by co-production with public and service users, with an engagement campaign currently in progress, seeking views on women's health, including on the menopause. More widely, Suffolk County Council have been an early adopter of the cafes uh, and have run several uh, successful meetings via the Women's Network. Further, the County Council has developed specific uh, guidance for the workplace uh, and is, there is reference to this in the absence policy with regards to considerations around menopause. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Reid. Now, in this kind of situation, there is no, um, no chance for a follow-up question there, so I'm going to move on to the second question, which is from Councillor Rob Bridgman to Councillor Paul West. Councillor Bridgman, please. Can the Cabinet Member for Operational Highways tell me what arrangements are in place for letting councillors know when road, footway, maintenance and resurfacing is scheduled to, take, to be taken in the divisions and whether he thinks they are accurate or adequate, I should say? Councillor West, please. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Bridgman, for the question. Um, Suffolk Highways aims to keep county councillors updated on all forward capital programmes of work that affect their division, such as resurfacing and footway works. This is done in a number of ways, depending on the type of work and whether a road closure is required. Um, these include uh, direct communication with county councillors, uh, usually around two weeks prior to the work starting, or in some cases, uh, forward programmes will be added to the various highway pages within the Suffolk County Council website, such as uh, weed treatment and grass cutting. Uh, then communicated to county councillors, I'll happily um, forward those web links to um, councillors after the meeting, so they're shared with everybody. Um, on the general gist of the question, though, I do believe that more can be done, particularly in relation to keeping the web pages current and up to date, and in relation to providing actual start dates and information when plans change. Often, uh, and I include myself in this, uh, councillors might be aware that a, a particular item within the capital programme is, is programmed within the next financial year or the financial year the year after, but not necessarily um, kept up to date when the actual schedule is finalised, which often is at short notice because of changing plans, as I've said. So I'm, I'm happy to take that general point forward and improve communications, which I think is what we would both want. Thank you very much, Councillor Wester. Do you have a supplementary, Councillor Bridgman? Um, I would simply just ask that you do bear that in mind for improvements. Um, I should start, as I mean to go on really, I'm a fairly positive character and uh, Mr West there, he helped me out no end. I didn't get the information, none of it happened like it should happen, but I did receive all the information within 24 hours, which was brilliant. Um, he's a friendly man. And we, we, we don't want him getting old and worked out by doing Keir's work for him. I'm Councillor Bridgman, sure you are a friendly man too, but I need a question. Uh, will you keep an eye on it to make sure that it does improve if it starts to go wrong? Or go further? Councillor West. <laughs> yes, well, I think we're in the part of the, the, the sort of meeting when sort of generosity and goodwill yeah. breaks out. So I, I also... Absolutely. I also find um, Rob, Councillor Bridgman, uh, very easy to engage with and very friendly himself. Oh. So. We could be bros, we, we could go <laughs> uh, 
and, uh, and we've got two minutes in this response, <laughs> Councillor. No, 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 no. no. We're, not, we're not. We're not. We're not going to have two minutes of it. Here. But, but no, I'm happy to take up his point, and of course, uh, keep a watch on that and keep you posted if, if things change. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor West. We're moving on now to Councillor Lockington, please, who has a question for Councillor Hoffensberger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and my question is for Councillor Hoffensberger. Given that social, uh, Suffolk County Council said during the budget scrutiny that customers' fees and charges income is due to fall short of the budget with 0.5 million, but again, this is expected when a significant number of customers are part of the NHS recharge and do not currently make contribution to their care. Could the portfolio holder for adult care inform us if Suffolk County Council is planning to, or already have done, increase the cost to customers for their care and with how much, and also explain how the recharging of the NHS is going for our residents who need care? Thank you, Councillor Lockington. A couple of questions in there, actually, I think, but still never mind. Councillor Hoffensberger. Thank you, Mr Chairman, and thank you, Councillor Lockington, for your question. The customer income forca forecast shortfall of 0.5 million for 2020 and 2021 mentioned in the budget scrutiny report was based on the position at quarter two of 2020-2021. I am pleased to confirm that by the end of the financial year, the position had improved and exceeded the income by 0.6 million. That, that in part was due to an increase in the care activity the second half of the year, which in turn led to higher customer income, but also because the hospital discharge policy changed midway through 2020-2021, limited the period of free care to six weeks, and it's now down to actually four weeks, which did not have such an impact on customer income. The current forecast position for 2021-22 is also for customer income to exceed the budget. 1,300 people were discharged to Suffolk County Council in 2020-2021 via the hospital discharge policy, with a total of 9.4 million being reclaimed by the NHS. This, this year to date, 700 people have been discharged and 3.6 million have reclaimed. We are awaiting guidance from the government as to whether the current scheme will continue beyond September. Outside of the hospital discharge policy, there have been no changes and neither any planned changes to the discretionary element of our customer charging arrangements this year, other than the normal uplifts for inflation. As with previous years, there is annual reassessment for customers' financial circumstances to ensure they are only paying an appropriate contribution towards their care. Thank you very much, Councillor Hoffensberger. Councillor Lockington, do you have a supplementary, please? Uh, Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Chairman, um, I wonder if you, the um, Council Hoffensberger saw the BBC report on the increase in charges for people, especially people with learning disability. Uh, does it mean that this county is not going to give any increase in any of the charges of the services which people pay for? Uh, because it would be interesting to learn um, given what was in the BBC in the freedom of information of many councils that were going to increase budget enormously. So it would be really good news to say that we are not going to increase our budgets specifically for our young, our adults with learning disability. Thank you, Councillor Lockington. Councillor Hoffensberger, please. Thank you, um, Councillor Lockington. Um, as I said, we're not we have no planned increase in our discretionary charges. The only increase we have is our inflationary care charge, which we do every year, which we agree with um, our care sector. I think there's a difference between increased budget and increased um, charges. Of course, we always want to increase our investment in the most vulnerable people of our society, um, but we do monitor that budget to make sure it's within a, a reasonable spend. But, Increasing budget is different to increase charges, which we have committed not to increase. Thank you very much, Councillor Hoffensberger. Now moving on to Councillor Andy Mellon, please, with a question for Councillor Paul West. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, 
My question is this, road closures in rural areas can cause severe disruption to road users with diversion routes often taking people several miles out of their way. But often poor signage does not show exactly where the closure is and this could be particularly problematic for emergency services uh, trying to access a particular location and it's frustrating for everyone else. Um, can the portfolio holder tell me what he's doing to improve this situation? Thank you. Councillor West, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Councillor Mellon. The answer might go slightly over two minutes, but it is, does address all the points, I hope. So, road closures on any part of the highway network, in particular the rural um, areas, are disruptive, and plan, run, planned road closures are always extensively considered before being implemented, as they are the least desired form of traffic management due to the impact that has been referenced on the highway network. Um, and there's never an ideal time for any closure, nor is there ever an ideal diversion route. There are only the least worst options available. Diversion routes are always investigated to ensure um, that they're using suitable roads for all vehicle types, which would normally use the category of the closed road um, following all the relevant guidance that's available. Planned works are applied for in advance uh, through an application process, and as part of that application process, the proposed, the proposed diversion route is reviewed, and that includes assessing the proposed roads to be used and whether the road category is suitable, and at this stage, any additional signage considered uh, necessary by Network Assurance, um, the County Council's team, um, which may help the travelling public as required by the County Council at this stage. The County Council carry out a sample of road closures when they're deployed on the network um, to ensure that those signs are being adequ adequately delivered as requested. I'm talking to officers because I do think there's scope to increase the sample um, of those audits to make sure that we do have signage that's um, in place. And, the other thing I would say is there are emergency road closures um, for reactive work where utilities and other organisations have a right to start the work in advance of notifying the County Council and I've come across <coughs> a number of those recently um, and in the worst case scenarios utilities can start work um, up to... <coughs> if it's over a weekend, up to two or three days ahead of notifying the County Council, which doesn't help um, um, get the message out, because often to the onlooker, and I include myself in this, you can't tell whether some work being done on the highway is, is emergency or not. And in that respect, I'm, I'm talking with officers because I'd like, as soon as the Council becomes aware of emergency work taking place for County Councillors and um, chairs of parish council to be informed as practical as possible. That's not always done at the moment, but we're looking at it. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Mellon, do you have a supplementary, please? I do, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I thank the, uh, the portfolio holder for his answer. Um, people in my division have been frustrated recently by full road closures, which, which they think could have been accommodated with a partial closure and traffic lights. But what really gets their goat and I'm sure other members have experienced emails on this issue, is when a repair has been done, the road is open, and yet the road close signs are left up for a day or two longer. Now, recently in Badwell Ash, um, the signs were still up, but the road was open. Uh, but an enterprising individual took it upon himself to improve the signage. Where it said road closed, he added a, a piece of cardboard which said, oh, no, it's not. <laughs> so can the Cabinet... Member, assure me, I see in his report that 20% of the inspections of these sites failed. Can I, can I request that he will clamp down on this sloppy procedure and make sure that this is improved? Thank you. Mr. West, that's for you to respond to, sir. Yeah, but uh, uh, of course I, can, I wouldn't um, accept that there's sloppiness on the part of network assurance within the County Council, who work incredibly hard to manage work in the road space while creating the minimum disruption. I would um, accept that certain utility companies are, are sloppy when they finish a job 
and don't take down the signage, and, and that's something we will look to improve, to put the matter into context, and I didn't realise these numbers until a couple of months ago, every year, on average, or in the last year, um, Network Assurance, on behalf of the County Council, received 65,000 65, applications for work in the highway, from utility companies, from Suffolk Highways, from developers. That's over 200 a day. And so, keeping on top of every single partial road closure is um, easier said than done. That's not to say I, I disagree with you. I think more can be done, but that just puts in context what the team within the County Council uh, are dealing with. But I'll happily keep you updated as we make progress to improve communication and reduce the sloppiness of utility companies, not the County Council. Thank you very much indeed, Councillor West. I'm now going to move on to questions from the floor. Uh, please raise your hand if you have a question. I will call as many people in 30 minutes as is possible. Um, that will take us around about quarter past five. So um, please register your hand with the monitoring officer. And the first on the list is Councillor Lindsay, please. Thank you. <coughs> um, my question, so I'd like to ask in advance if I can, but um, time and, and so on, um, and this only re really was raised with me recently, but um, my question is for Councillor Smith um, regarding the housing development plans in Mildon Hall and Lower Stoff. Can you guarantee that the new houses that you want to build at Mildon Hill and Lowestoft uh, will not be heated by fossil fuel? Thanks. Councillor Smith. We are, Chairman, some way away from final decisions about houses to be built on our land in Mildon Hall and in Corton near Lowestoft. I listen to what Councillor Lindsay says and I can't give a definite answer because I don't think the decisions have yet been made. We haven't even got planning permission. We're not even on outline planning permission yet there. But I understand why he makes those points and when I have discussions with officers, I will include his views. Thank you very much, Councillor Smith. Do you have a supplementary, Councillor Lindsay? Um, yes, I do. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that, none of that precludes you from, from making it a policy of the Council beforehand. So my, my follow-up question is, is the real reason that you can't make that guarantee connected to the fact that you were the only Councillor to vote against the climate emergency two years ago? You're absolutely right. And I, I'm not ashamed of that. I am not a Green, I am a Conservative. I'm not going to give the guarantee that you request. Right. I see no other hands for questions to Cabinet members. Oh, Councillor Bryce. Thank you, Chairman. Just a brief question to Councillor West, if I may. Um, would Councillor West agree with me that in reviewing the communications within his portfolio area that the dedicated Councillor Highways team do an exemplary job in supporting us all with highways queries across our divisions? Councillor West. I think I know what the answer is going to be. But let's... Yes. Um, no, I, I, I do agree. And they do an incredible job turning around <laughs> sort of many many dozens of um, questions a week, a lot of which are thunder through from my email address, but, but also um, others. And they're, they're, I mean, it's not appropriate to name um, staff, but I think they all work incredibly hard and uh, we owe them sort of thanks for keeping on top of all our, our queries. Councillor Bryce, do you have a supplementary? No, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Topping has a hand raised. Thank you, Chair. I'm sure you'll put me right if I've got this wrong, as it's my first council meeting. We are asking questions on item agenda 9A. Yes? No, 
I'm not, not sure, quite sure if that's correct. Is uh, the portfolio holder um, for the Kickstart scheme? Sorry, is that you? Sorry, sorry, leader. Um, okay, on page 48, um, I've just got a question regards the um, the first council Kickstart trainees started their placement. I'm going to read the report. During April, May, and June, with 11 in place by the end of June. So my question is, do we know how many we've got in place now, please? That's the Hicks. I don't have that figure here. To Sorry, I don't have that figure here today, but I can get it to you. But it has been a challenge during the COVID pandemic to actually get people who want to come forward for the Kickstart programme. So it has been a slower start than I think anyone would have liked. Uh, it's a national issue, but um, we are absolutely clear that we want to raise the numbers as quickly as we can, particularly as an authority. Oops, do you have a supplementary council? Thank you. Yes, and I'm just going to carry on because it says that we are funding up to 75 placements. So my supplementary would be how are we going to to engage with these, please, to try and fulfil those 75 places. Thank you. Yeah, we engage, we engage, we have a, the team goes out and engages with schools, colleges. We're always doing what we can to increase the numbers when people leave. Um, it is a battle at the moment, as I said, with the pandemic to actually get people to have the enthusiasm to come forward, but the team is out there. We have a target. We want to get to the numbers and we'll do everything we can to get there. Councillor Wellam, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, a question of Councillor West, I think. Um, as Councillor Hudson said, the, uh, the administration is committed 100% to making Suffolk the greenest county. Judging by the applause that broke out, I assume that the, the commitment still stands, or is this an unfunded commitment? Either way, will you please commit yourself to ensuring that all existing footpaths and cycle routes are fit for purpose by the end of the financial year, please. Councillor West. Uh, yep, sure. I'm, I'm happy to commit to sort of renewing our um, pledge to keep all the footpaths and cycle routes in line with our highways maintenance operational plan, which is agreed um, every year, can be viewed on the on the website if Councillor Willem has any particular um, mm -hmm. footpath or cycleway that he wishes me to comment on, happy to receive that after the meeting and email you accordingly. Councillor Willem, do you have a supplementary? Thank you, Chair. So this, this means that it is down to local members to highlight where the problems are. For instance, there is a cycle route between, say, Stowe Market and Needham Market which I assume should be more than 18 inches wide, but the problem is that the vegetation grows so quickly uh, that I don't recall it ever being trimmed back, certainly not in the last two years. Councillor West, please. Yeah. Uh, no, no, um, you shouldn't take it that my answer was that it's down to the division councillor solely to um, keep the council up to date on the condition of footpaths and, and roads and the highway network. Obviously we have inspectors that go round. The county councillor in the division can play a part towards that because obviously um, we're all the people on the ground in our own division. So the example and the specific that you've just given me, happy to take that away and ask officers to comment subsequently to you. Thank you very much indeed. Now I really do see no, oh, Councillor Soons please. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if my question is, is to our leader, Matthew Hicks. Um, the ethnicity pay gap report, which I was really pleased to see, because I was born, sorry, I'm wearing my mask still. Um, I was um, born into a mixed race South Asian family um, and grew up on a diet of curry, which I adore to this day. Um, and I see that um, this is the first ethnicity pay report that's being completed and the council's employee with clear analysis and a supporting action plan has now been widely shared and well received. And I sit on the, on the committee that received that report. Are we the first council to have this report compiled? Um, I, I thought we might be. I understand that, that um, district councils haven't yet commissioned a report like this. And if we are, congratulations. Councillor Hicks, please. I'm not, I, th I think, and I'll double check, that it's a requirement. This is a requirement, so I think most councils will be bringing it forward. Whether we were the first to get it out, I don't know, but I'll find out. 
Thank you, Councillor Hicks. Do you have a supplementary, Councillor Soons? No? Okay, then. Right, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the business for today's meeting. Uh, Councillors, please, can you take all your belongings, paperwork and any rubbish with you, place your microphone smart card in the collection box by the meeting room exit, and return your nameplate to the table outside the meeting room from whence you collected it. Please leave the building promptly and observe social distancing guidelines whilst in the building. Please follow any guidance regarding which desks are designated for work purposes. Finally, remember to check your pigeonhole before you leave today. And thank you for your participation, and I wish you a safe journey home.